Severed Souls, The Sword of Truth By Terry Goodkind Read by Alec Voles Chapter 27 Colin straightened. She felt goosebumps tingling along her arms. She blinked at the mystifyingly motionless Samantha. She had no idea what the problem could be, but there was no time to stand there and work it out. Colin frantically tried to think. For sure they couldn't stay there. They were mere moments from it being too late even to run. Just as Colin looked back down in the darkness, unable to tell for sure exactly how close the Shuntuck were, the moon, almost directly overhead, broke through a hole in the thick cloud cover for the first time that night, lighting the narrow defile in pale, eerie light. Colin could see the wet, slick, nearly vertical stone walls soaring up from the narrow chasm of broken rock with the brook running down through it. At the base of those towering rock walls, the river of white figures of the Shuntuck raced up the ravine, predators with their prey almost within reach. Hundreds of men and women in the lead stretched clawed hands forward in anticipation, each wanting to be the first to have the soul in front of them. Mouths gaped open, teeth bared. They wailed like wolves after prey. Colin had no idea what Samantha was doing or what might be wrong with her. The thought occurred to her that maybe she was frozen in terror. Colin had seen that happen in battle. A person would be so panicked, so afraid, that their minds could no longer think, and they would give up, just standing there in place, waiting for death to take them. Sometimes, death was less frightening than what life had to offer. Colin's first thought was that maybe she could circle an arm around Samantha's skinny waist, hike her up, hold her against a hip, and carry her up the gorge. But as soon as she thought of it, she realized that she certainly couldn't outpace the Shuntuck while carrying the young woman, even if she was small and skinny. She knew that if she tried, they would both die. Colin knew that she was going to have to fight or run. Leaving Samantha and running meant abandoning her to the savages to be eaten alive. Colin gripped her sword tighter, despite the magic from the sword desperately wanting the fight, wanting the blood of the enemy. Colin knew that fighting the Shantuck alone, even with the Sword of Truth, would be suicide. There was no time. It was now or never. Run or fight. The only thing that made any sense at all was to run. If it was to be running, then it had to be now. They had to run or they were going to die. Samantha, there's no time. Run. That time the young woman said it was such cold power that it ran a chill through Colin. Colin straightened and stared for a second at the motionless young sorceress. Her fingers pressed to her temples, her head bowed, her eyes closed. Colin glanced back at the black eye sockets, clawed hands, and open mouths of the Shuntuck running wildly up the defile toward them. There was no choice. If she stayed, they both died. Colin couldn't help anyone else if she died trying to save this one person. Viewed in that light, there was no choice. Heartbroken at the choice, Colin bolted and took off running up the gorge, racing as if her life depended on it. Because it did. There was a good-sized gap ahead to the men. A glance back over her shoulder showed another gap back to the Shuntuck, but not much of one. Samantha stood motionless on the rock in the middle of the brook, in the center of that gap. As Colin turned once more up the hill, running as fast as her legs would carry her, the ground suddenly shook with such a violent shock that she fell sprawling face first in the center of the brook. She twisted as she sat up, coughing out water, looking back when the concussion from the blast flattened her. It was so powerful that it felt as if it had stopped her heart for a beat. Confused, Colin sat up again just in time to see the air of the moonlit defile filled with flying rock. She blinked at what she was seeing. It made no sense. Large, jagged pieces of granite spiraled through the air. Huge slabs that had broken along rift lines slid downward with ever-accelerating speed. As they dropped, they trailed shattered bits of stone and smoke from the friction created under such tremendous weight. To either side of the narrow defile, explosions expanded the rock, lifting great chunks up and outward. Inside those expanding, interlocking pieces of rock, Colin could see the remnants of the flashes that had ignited deep inside the rock and blasted it apart. The sound of the explosions thundered and boomed, 
tearing the rock walls apart. More explosions in quick succession raced down the gorge on both sides, dozens of heart-stopping thumps in a rapid series, blowing the mountain to pieces. Flashes ripped in sequence down the faces of bluffs, loosening the bedrock from the mountain. In the center of the turmoil below her, Samantha hadn't moved an inch. Below her, the thundering booms that shook the ground took the feet of the shuntuck out from under them. The rock walls to either side below the young woman shook with repeated explosions racing down the length of the defile, blowing the walls apart. In the moonlight, Colin could see stone spires topple, folding as they dropped. Countless tons of rock came crashing down atop the shuntuck trapped in the gorge below. Through the thundering, echoing booms and the singular ripping sound of granite cracking and breaking, Colin could hear men and women screaming. The shuntuck were helpless beneath the cataclysm violently ripping rock apart above them. They had no time to escape and had nowhere to run. Colin blinked as she saw a series of thundering booms rip along in an extensive chain down the rock walls. The flashes, like lightning within the stone itself, hammered in quick succession, one following almost atop the boom of the one before, rippling one after another down the gorge. There could be no doubt whatsoever that whatever was happening was being directed intelligently. It was obvious to Colin, by the order and placement of the rock-ripping explosions, that it was meant to collapse the walls to both sides of the defile into the gorge at the bottom. Every blast that blew stone outward was timed in an ordered sequence that knocked out support to ensure that the colossal weight of the rock would help pull the walls down. By the enormity of the blasts and their locations, the walls had to fall. It was the most elegantly composed scene of utter destruction Colin had ever witnessed. As she watched the walls tumbling in, sending clouds of dust and debris rolling up through the trees, it went on and on, as if in a livid tantrum of destruction. It sounded like the world was being ripped apart by the rapid series of thundering explosions. The sound reverberated through the mountains all around. Stone fragments of every size and shape sailed through the air, tumbling down the collapsing walls of the gorge, lifting above the flashes of explosions, or cascading and bouncing down atop what had already fallen. All up and down the gorge below Samantha, the world looked like it was coming apart. As a particularly immense cliff toppled, twisting as it fell so that it landed down the length of the defile, dust, like smoke, expelled from under where the cliff landed, billowed out to roll up the gorge. The wall of wind from the explosions and buckling walls nearly knocked Colin down again. For just an instant, Colin wondered if this was the end of the world of life, if it was actually being caused by Sulachan, furious that they might escape his shuntuck. Yet more cliffs, thrown forward by internal explosions that lit like lightning rippling along inside the rock, toppled out and then dropped with thundering force. They hit so hard, the ground shook. The world rocked and moved as if it was all being caused by an earthquake. But Colin saw the explosions, and she knew that this was no earthquake. It was directed destruction to a purpose. The sound of cracking granite continued popping and reverberating through the canyon without abating. Another series of booming explosions farther down the gorge shook the ground with each thumping explosion. Each concussion felt like a fist pounding Colin's chest. Clouds of dusty rock boiled up as yet more rock and debris came crashing down in specific places, ensuring that no part of the gorge escaped the calamity. In a brief pause, Colin scrambled to her feet and raced back down the gorge to Samantha. The young woman still hadn't moved. Her black hair was covered in a layer of dust that made her look gray. The world around her was coming apart and she hadn't moved. Shuntuck below her were dying by the hundreds, if not thousands, and still she had not moved. There was no doubt in Colin's mind as to the intelligence directing the spectacle still going on. Impossibly, Colin saw a few shuntuck covered in dust scrambling out from the leading edge of the rubble. There had to be a few dozen. They saw Colin and Samantha and started for them. Colin hoped they weren't the ones with occult sorcery, 
and that her sword could stop them. Just then, Colin heard granite cracking in the cliff right above them. She looked up and saw the cliff tremble and shake. She could see huge cracks racing through the wet rock. Sections pulled apart, taking trees with them. A sudden thundering boom to each side over her head made Colin gasp. She scooped the wisp of a young woman up in her arms and started running up the gorge. She ran with all her strength. Right behind, the towering wall of rock cracked away from the mountain, toppled and crashed down with thunderous force right where Samantha had been standing only a moment before. Colin almost lost her footing as the ground shook violently, but she managed to keep going. Sections of rock the size of small palaces came to a rocking halt where Samantha had been standing moments before. Had Colin not snatched her up, the young woman would have been killed. The shuntuck that had temporarily escaped had been buried under countless tons of the fallen mountain. Colin stopped, turning back, trying to catch her breath. All down the gorge, she could see loosened slabs continuing to topple. Enormous blocks, no longer having any support, slid with accelerating speed to sail out past the remaining edges to fall through space and pound down atop the rubble-filled gorge. As she watched, spellbound, a few remaining sections that were fractured and loose gave way, collapsing down atop the masses of stone already fallen from the mountains. The gorge was filled with hundreds of feet of the stone debris. As far down the mountain as she could see, the sides of the gorge had all fallen in. Colin couldn't be certain, of course, but she could not imagine how a single shuntuck could still be alive. Dear spirits, girl, what in the world did you just do? What Lord Rawl taught me to do, Samantha said. Her voice choked with tears. Her thin arms clutched Colin's neck as she wept into her shoulder. Colin didn't know what Samantha was talking about. I was so afraid, she cried. I was so afraid we were all going to be eaten. I couldn't let that happen. I had to do something. I was so angry that they were going to eat us thinking they could steal our souls for themselves. I was so angry that they would eat my mother, especially after we just got her free, and that they would eat Lord Rawl and you, and everyone else, all for some stupid belief. I was so angry. So you used some kind of magic? Colin asked. She couldn't understand what she had done or how. I knew my mother and Zed and Niki had tried to use regular magic, and it didn't harm the Shuntuck, so I knew magic wouldn't work against them. But I heard you say that even if they had occult powers, they would still bleed. So then I knew that was the way to stop them kill them without magic. All I could think of was to do what Lord Rawl taught me. Colin held the young sorceress's head of thick black hair to her shoulder. It's all right, Samantha. You did good. Richard will be proud when I tell him that you just saved us all. Colin could not for the life of her imagine what in the world Richard could have taught Samantha that could bring mountains crashing down. Colin watched carefully in the moonlight for a time. There was no one chasing them. Chapter 28 An impatient Commander Fister stood waiting in front of his men as Colin reached them. What in the world just happened? He asked, sounding angry and frightened at the same time. The walls fell down, Colin said. He made the oddest face and opened his mouth to say something, but then decided better of it. Colin didn't think that any of them had ever seen such an extraordinary thing happen before. They had all just witnessed power on a rarefied level. Is Richard all right? Colin asked the commander. Fister nodded, as all right as he was before, anyway. Samantha was still clutching Colin tightly and still weeping. It seemed she had been frightened, too, frightened by the realization of what she had done. Samantha had just used her power to kill probably thousands of people, half people, anyway. Colin suspected, though, that it was as much from the emotional exhaustion of the ordeal and the terror that had driven her to do such a thing as anything else. At the end of a particularly violent and exhausting battle, Colin sometimes felt like sitting down and having a good cry. But she was a confessor, and her mother had taught her from an early age that she couldn't let people who depended on her see such weakness. Seeing weakness in leaders made people lose confidence in that leader and in themselves. Well, from what I was told, the commander said, Samantha had stopped in the middle of the brook and was just standing there. So what? 
Not now, Jake, Colin said. She gestured. Let's get moving. I don't think that any of the Shuntucks survived what I just saw, but if they did, I don't want to have them catch us sitting around celebrating. I want to put some distance between us and them, if any are still alive. He pointed up to the soaring walls on each side of the gorge. Besides, it's probably not the best idea to stand around under rocks and cliffs that might have been loosened by all that shaking. I wouldn't want what happened to the Shuntuck to happen to us. Colin nodded with a worried look back down the gorge. It wasn't that far to the site of the buried Shuntuck. That much violence could easily have weakened the walls above them. The commander cocked his head. Do you think any are still alive? I mean, they have that occult sorcery after all. Colin considered his question briefly. I can't be certain, of course. But I can't imagine how they could have survived the mountains to each side falling in on them. I think they were all crushed under hundreds of feet of rock. Doesn't matter how much sorcery you have if a boulder the size of a house falls on you. I'm pretty sure they are all dead. Pretty sure. He still sounded hesitant. Couldn't there be a pocket created by a huge slab that spared some of them? If there are any alive, they might be able to dig out. They can bring the dead back to life, remember? If even one of them with such powers is alive, he could raise an army of dead to come after us. After what I witnessed, I don't see how there could be anyone left to dig out and bring the dead back to life. Even if they survived in a pocket, they are still buried by hundreds of feet of rock. I can't imagine they could ever dig out. Colin let out a deep breath. But just in case, and more importantly, to get out from under these steep walls, it's a good idea to keep moving, at least for a little while, so we can put some distance between us and all the Shuntuck buried down there. I don't like being this close to them, even if it is a graveyard now. I don't especially like sleeping beside a graveyard. Let's keep going, but take it a little slower. I think we're all pretty tired. These are men of the first file, Mother Confessor. They can carry you on their shoulders and march double time all night long. Colin nodded. I know, but I think it's up to us to decide to give them the rest they may not be aware they need. She arched an eyebrow at him. Didn't I always make sure that you and your men were rested before you went out at night to bring me back strings of enemy ears? Commander Fister snorted a short laugh. Let's move a little farther up the mountain, Colin said, and then let the men get some sleep before morning. Commander Fister tapped a fist to his heart in salute. Where's Richard? Colin asked. The commander pointed a thumb up the gorge. Niki is watching over him. Zed and Irina are farther up, making sure the way ahead is safe. Colin was glad to hear that. If there was one person she would want watching over Richard, it was Niki. Samantha hadn't moved. She seemed to be content where she was in Colin's arms. Colin thought that maybe she didn't want the others to see the tear stains running down her dusty face. You okay? Colin whispered. Samantha nodded. Just tired. So tired. Colin could imagine that well enough. As Colin carried Samantha up the gorge, making her way through the relieved men, she finally reached the horse. By the time she got there, Samantha was hanging limp, asleep in Colin's arms. Colin was dead tired, and as thin as Samantha was, she was still heavy. But Colin felt good holding the young woman. It felt good to be needed for comfort and shelter. Niki stood in a rush as Colin came close. What in the world was that? What are you so angry about? Colin asked with a frown. The woman looked like she wanted to skin a dragon. It killed the Shuntuck, not us. Niki cast a suspicious look at Samantha asleep in Colin's arms. Did she do that? Colin nodded. Niki appraised the young woman a moment longer. How? She said that Richard taught her. Niki shot a look back over her shoulder at the unconscious Richard. Of course he did. Colin spotted Irina in the distance, racing toward them. Look, Niki, let's not frighten her mother about this right now. We'll talk about it later. I think we need to get away from here just in case. Then we all need to get some rest. You and Zed and Samantha need to rest if you are to recover your abilities. All right? Niki heaved a sigh as in the distance Irina was calling her daughter's name. All right, Niki said. Let's get moving. I want to find a safe place. Then Zed and I can work on waking Richard. It can't be soon enough for me, 
Colin said. Irina might be able to help with it. Nikki folded her arms. Zed and I can do it. We'll get him back, I swear. Colin nodded. Thanks, Nikki. She wondered why Nikki didn't want Irina helping. It was Richard, though, so she supposed that Nikki was not willing to take any chances with letting someone she didn't really know touch him with her power. Nikki leaned close and shook her finger in Colin's face. But when I wake that husband of yours, I intend to ask him just what in the world he taught that girl. Colin smiled. I bet you will. Chapter 29 After a march of nearly two hours, they came to a prominence at the head of the gorge from where a small waterfall fed the brook down where they stood. They needed to get up the steep rise and out of the gorge. While not as difficult as it would be to ascend the steep walls to the sides, Colin didn't much like the idea of climbing rugged terrain in the dark. She also didn't want to use torches or lanterns because it would allow anyone hunting them to be able to spot them from miles away. At least the moon was still out. Commander Fister was eager to be on to higher ground for the defensive protection that it afforded. In much the same way they had used the gorge to trap the Shuntuk in the confines of a gorge, those same tactics could be used to corner them. Colin didn't think that there could be any Shuntuk left alive, but she had put the sword back in the scabbard Richard was wearing, which also meant putting away its attendant rage. Without the sword's intoxicating drive to fight, she took seriously the commander's advice for the extra measure of safety. Besides, she had no way to be certain that every one of the Shuntuk was dead. What if there really had been a pocket under a slab of granite where some of them might have survived? What if even one of those with occult sorcery was still alive and later emerged to sneak up on them? What if, because she didn't want to climb a hillside in the dark, that remaining Shuntuk killed Zed, or Niki, or Richard, or any of them for that matter? Each life was precious. That was, after all, ultimately what they were fighting to protect, the sanctity of every life. Colin didn't want any of these men dying. She wanted them to be able to live in peace and not have to do the job at which they were so good. Perhaps worst of all, the thought of being awakened suddenly and trying to scramble up out of the gorge in the dark with bloodthirsty Shuntuk grabbing their ankles and pulling them back down into waiting arms of flesh-eating half-people had her more than willing to do what was necessary to get up and out of the gorge before they stopped for the remainder of the night. With the sword no longer gripped in her fist, exhaustion was setting in. But she was mostly interested in Zed and Niki having a safe place to get the rest and food they needed so they would be able to apply their full gifted ability to strengthen Richard and bring him back from the pull of death. When Colin agreed to the commander's advice to press on and make the difficult climb to find a safer place to set up camp, he sent some men ahead first to scout the best way up. Colin's clothes were stiff and sticky from all the blood of the Shuntuck she had killed. She had no idea how many she had slaughtered. The memory of it was a blur of relentless fighting interspersed with halting mental visions of particularly desperate, violent moments. Her hair was stiff and matted with blood. She was glad she didn't have a mirror handy, but by the looks she got, she could imagine well enough what a sight she must be. In the war, some of the men she had led in battle at the time had called her their warrior queen. They hadn't meant it as the demotion such a title actually was, but it was meant as their highest tribute. So she had always accepted it in the spirit in which it had been intended. Titles meant more to Colin than they did to Richard, but probably because she had been born a confessor. Her title was part of her inherent nature. That power she carried within her couldn't be separated from her by removing the title. It had taken the touch of death from the hedge maid to block her from that inner ability. People had avoided and feared her all her life for the power she carried. That fear set her apart, kept her from so many of the simple pleasures of life that they could enjoy without a thought, even as simple a thing as a benevolent smile or nod in passing. It was not because she wanted to be set apart. She didn't but because people had always distanced themselves from confessors. Most everyone feared confessors, and in many, 
That fear had curdled into hatred. No one smiled or nodded at a confessor the way they did a normal person. Even those who respected the confessors still feared them. She had always been able to see the tension in the faces of anyone who spotted her. All her life, she could detect the tremble in most people's voice when they spoke to her. She could often see their hands start to shake when she spoke to them. She always did her best to pretend not to notice in order to, as gracefully as possible, put them at ease. That was usually the best she could do. They feared what they feared. Most of those who had been close to her for a time grew more used to her as they came to realize that a confessor was not going to suddenly lose control and unleash her power on them. At times, they came to almost forget about her power. Almost. That inherent nature also drew those who wanted to kill her. For that reason, confessors had once each been assigned a wizard to protect them. But all those other confessors were long dead, as were the wizards assigned to them, including Giller, the wizard once assigned to Colin. Those who hated a confessor's ability to uncover truth had finally been able to kill them all. All but her. Now, Colin was married to her wizard, Richard, who was, more importantly, the man she loved. In a way, her title, the one she was born with, Confessor, and then Mother Confessor, the title given her by her sister confessors, represented her armor, the armor she wore to fight for truth. In that way, she was a warrior queen. Those other confessors had wanted her to be the one who led them in that fight for truth. She was the one. Born a simple confessor, she now was, and always would be, the mother confessor, the last of her kind. Richard was the first man who had not avoided her because of what she was. Of course, he hadn't known at the time that she was the mother confessor, or even known what being a confessor really meant. As she had come to know Richard, though, she came to understand that even had he known, it wouldn't have stopped him from wanting to get closer to her. Nothing would have. Richard was a very rare person. He was the one. He was the one for her, the only one. In so many ways, Richard was the only one. He was a point of singularity. She had felt a pull to him that they had both felt from the first moment their eyes had met that fateful day in the Heartland Woods. Richard was referred to in prophecy as the pebble in the pond. Ripples from that pebble touched everything. He rippled through so much about prophecy that in that way he had created ripples through time itself. Sometimes it made her head hurt to think about all the interlocking connections. So she simply loved him and tried not to think about all the wider implications of any of it. But Richard was always thinking about it, even when he didn't consciously realize it. She could see it in his gray eyes when he was quietly watching the sunset. Even when he looked into her eyes, she could tell that there were always some kind of cosmic calculations going on somewhere in the deep recesses of his mind. Since he had come into her life, others had come to treat her differently, to accept her. She now got smiles and sincere nods, especially from soldiers like these. She had fought beside them, and they had come to know her for who she was, and that she was more than simply a confessor. Richard had done that. He had changed everything. While she waited for the men to scout the climb, Colin joined some of the soldiers under the gentle falls to wash blood out of her hair and off her clothes. They shared a bar of soap with her, soldiers all, passing it around to wash off the blood of their enemy. Fortunately, after the exertion of battle, the cold water felt good on her sore muscles. It wasn't a proper bath with her clothes on, but they needed to be washed as well, and in the wilds of the Darklands, even this much was a luxury she very much appreciated. As she wiped the clean water back off her long hair, some of the men told her how proud they were of how much blood she'd had all over her. They had viewed her blood-soaked hair as a mantle she had earned. They seemed especially pleased to see that she was just as committed as they were to killing the enemy that she was willing to do all that she asked of them, and that she had waded into the task with every ounce of commitment they did. Colin understood their feelings, but she still wanted all the blood off her. 
She was looking forward to Richard waking and giving him a kiss. She wanted to look her best for that first kiss, welcoming him back to the world of life. Chapter 30 Once the scouts had found a good route, the climb was easier than they'd thought it would be. Fortunately, the way up was easy enough that the horse could negotiate the steep climb without too much difficulty. So they were able to save time by leaving Richard lashed in place. The climb was mercifully short, but Colin's legs kept cramping from the effort of the long scramble up through the gorge, much of it at a dead run, to say nothing of what had seemed like an endless battle. The steeper ascent up the prominence and out of the gorge, short as it was, demanded that she dig deep for enough strength to make it. Her arms felt like lead from swinging the sword. She knew that she was going to be sore for a couple of days. She reminded herself to be thankful for the sore muscles. It was better to be alive to feel sore than to be dead. She tried not to think of how many times she had come close to dying. She thought of Richard and tried not to think of how close both of them still were to dying. At the top of the climb, in the lap of surrounding mountains, the land flattened out. A small lake collecting mountain runoff fed the falls and the brook down in the gorge. One of the men scattered out ahead beyond swampy ground thick with reeds and then through the woods beyond the far shore, while another two scouted to either side. The center scout ran back from the woods and motioned for them with three sparks from his steel and flint. At seeing the three small flashes of sparks, they all hurried around the small moonlit lake, beyond the expanse of reeds and into the woods beyond. After following the man a brief distance across ground covered with a soft bed of pine needles beneath a stand of towering pines, they emerged on the far side, where they were brought to a halt at the brink of a chasm. In the moonlight, it looked like a black snake stretching off to the left and right, as far in each direction as they could see. Niki cast a sparkling flame down the deep fissure. The light continued sinking far longer than Colin would have expected. Seeing how deep it was, they all took a step back from the edge. It was far too steep and too deep to climb down. As far as she could see, there was no way over the chasm. Looks like we're going to have to go either left or right, Zed offered. Colin scanned the forest on the far side of the chasm. Not a lot of choice. We're hemmed by the gorge and this rift. If we could get to the other side, this kind of natural barrier would make it a safer place to get the rest we all need. I left my wings at home, Zed grumbled. Colin was at least cheered to hear that his impish nature was returning. She turned when she heard a commotion coming through the woods. As a group of soldiers approached, getting slaps on the back from other soldiers, Colin recognized the men. It was Sergeant Remkin and the men he had taken to block the rear of the gorge in order to trap the Shuntuck. Remkin, how did you get here? Commander Fister asked. I feared we'd lost you. How did you manage to escape the walls falling in? Blocking the rear turned out not to be so simple, he said, as he paused to catch his breath for a moment. What do you mean? Colin asked. We waited and waited for the Shuntuck to all get into the gorge so we could close it off. But they just kept coming. We were getting pretty nervous that there would be too many to fit the length of the gorge, and then we wouldn't be able to trap them. We knew that would ruin the whole plan. Then we saw the wizard's fire far off in the distance ahead. It slowed their advance at times, but rather than turning and running, they kept moving toward it. The whole time, more of them coming out of the woods, racing into the gorge. Did they all enter, though? Colin asked. Did all of them get into the gorge? The sergeant nodded. When we saw the wizard's fire begin and felt the ground shake, we knew we needed to get behind the tail end of them in case they decided to try to escape. Finally, we were pretty sure that they had all filed into the gorge. We waited a bit, wanting to make sure there wouldn't be any stragglers to come out of the woods and surprise us from behind. We wanted to close the trap, not get trapped ourselves. So when we didn't see more for a time, we knew that was our chance to finally close the gate on them. Despite the fire and lightning we could see off in the distance up ahead, they were so intent on chasing the rest of you, they kept going. That's when we came down the slopes to cut them off from behind. And then a couple of them appeared, coming back at us. They were smiling. He looked at each of them to make his point. Smiling. Then they started doing something to our men. Doing something? What do you mean? Fister asked. The sergeant rubbed a shoulder as he stared off again. 
I don't know. It sounds crazy. He looked back at them. I saw a man just seem to... to... I don't know. Melt? Colin said. His brow lifted in surprise. Yes. Exactly. The skin started melting right off several of my men. Their bones came apart, and they went down in a mess that no longer looked human. Are you saying that there was more than one of these smiling shuntuck? Colin asked. At least two that I saw. There might have been more, but I saw two for sure. Two was enough. I realized that if we stayed there trying to hold the back door, we were all going to die. I thought our best chance was to get up here and warn you of what kind of powers they had. Help you fight to get away. It's disheartening to know that the one we saw wasn't the only one, Colin said. You did the right thing. There is no way to stand and fight such men. You did? Commander Fister reminded her. You went after him. You killed the one we saw. Colin dismissed the notion with a gesture. Yes, but I had Richard's sword. Sergeant Remkin and his men would have been slaughtered for no good reason. They did the right thing. I would imagine that men with such dark talents would have been there as rear guards. Sergeant Remkin nodded. I thought the same thing, because after they killed several of our men and we took off, those smiling shuntuck rushed back like they were intent on protecting their rear. But how did you get around all the rest of them and catch up with us? Colin asked. It wasn't easy, he said. Those I have with me, the ones still alive, are all mountain men. We grew up in this kind of country, and we are used to traveling in mountains. We were able to get up on the higher portions of the hillsides, out of sight of those demons with occult powers. We knew by the lay of the land that ridges often run parallel to gorges. The higher ones can make good routes through this kind of country. We were lucky and found a ridge we could follow and quickly cover a lot of distance. He gestured down into the abyss. We were following the edge of the ridge and keeping contact with the gorge to make sure we could get to you. From up there, we encountered this chasm running in the same direction as some of the ridges, like a rift in the mountains. Far as we could tell, it cuts through a lot of territory. We didn't follow the lower end to see how far it went back that way because we were trying to stay closer to the gorge. That's when we saw you climbing up. So then, we at least know that this chasm runs back that direction for quite a distance, Colin said, trying to think of what they would do to get around it. So were you able to see if the Shuntuck stayed in the gorge? Did any of them try to escape the lower end when you went up onto the ridge? When we were still farther back, we reached the top after the wizard's fire ended. We hung back to see if they would turn back, but they kept going, howling, intent on getting to you. They probably felt pretty safe with those smiling bastards bringing up the rear. We never saw any of them turn back. Then we started to hear explosions. The entire length of the gorge shook as it started exploding apart. At times up on the ridge, with the way the ground was shaking, we couldn't even maintain our footing and stand up. It was crazy. The cliffs to both sides, down the entire gorge, all blew apart and collapsed down into the defile and buried the Shuntuck. Do you think it buried them all? Colin asked. He shrugged. Hard telling from up as high as we were on the mountain. As far as I could tell, the explosions in the falling walls extended back well past where I'd seen the tail end of the line of Shuntuck. So I'm pretty sure that with as fast as it all happened, it caught them all in the gorge and buried them. With as much stone as fell in on them, surely none of them could have escaped with their lives. After it ended, we didn't hear them howling anymore. There weren't even any cries or screams of any left alive and injured. It was dead silent. Commander Fister let out a sigh. That's good news. Still, Colin said, as she gestured at the dark rift before them, I'd feel better if we could get across this chasm to the other side. So then let's get across. Sergeant Remkin said, as if it were only a skip and a hop. It wasn't. It was discouragingly wide, far too wide by a long shot for any person to jump. We don't have a way to get across, Colin said. Remkin shrugged. Easy. She frowned at the man. Easy? Zed leaned a bony shoulder into the conversation. Nothing is ever easy. Sergeant Remkin shrugged again. Sure it is. He flicked a hand up at the trees, towering over them as they stood near the edge of the chasm. Just fell a tree and walk over. Then, when we all get across, push the tree down into the chasm. Even if there were any shuntuck left, they won't be able to follow us. 
Collins shared a look with Commander Fister. She wondered if he felt as stupid as she did. That would work, Fister said, trying not to sound too surprised by the idea. Good thinking, Remkin. What about the horse? Zed asked. How are you going to get the horse carrying Richard to walk across a log spanning that chasm? Horses can't walk on a log. Not so easy now, is it? Sergeant Remkin shrugged again. All we need to do is fell a second tree right next to it, then cut down another tree and split it into planks. Lay planks between the two tree trunks to make a kind of roadbed, blindfold the horse, and lead him across. He shrugged again. Easy. After we're done, it's a simple enough matter with all the men we have and a few ropes to send the whole thing crashing down into the gorge. I haven't seen the Shuntuck with anything more than a knife, so I don't know that they would be able to fell a tree to follow the same way. They'll have to go around. And from what I've seen on the way up here, it would be a long journey. Colin shared another look with Commander Fister. Unless they can fly, the sergeant added with a smile. Still not easy, Zed said. It's a lot more work than it sounds like. He folded his arms. But a bit of magic would speed the task. Sergeant Remkin bowed his head. It certainly would, sir. Well, you sound like the man to handle it, Sergeant, the commander said. Why don't you take the men you need and get it done as fast as you can? Zed will help. We need to get across to a safe place to set up camp. It's already the middle of the night, and we need to get what rest we can before morning. The sergeant tapped a fist to his heart. At once, Commander. After the man had rushed off to collect his men, Zed stepped closer. I'd be a lot happier about the sergeant's plan if he didn't look so blasted young. Colin's worry returned to Richard as she laid an arm over his back. We will be able to help him soon, Nikki said. Colin nodded. She had been to that dark place where he was now. She knew the effort from the gifted that it was going to take to bring him back to her. Zed put a hand on her shoulder. Nikki is right, Colin. We will get him back. I promise. Colin forced a smile. Wizards always keep their promises. He nodded with an earnest look. Indeed they do. Chapter 31 Colin found a private spot to lay out a blanket at the far side of the encampment, right up against a small rock outcropping at the edge of the forest. The rock sheltered her from the occasional night breeze. The moon was still out, so at least they didn't need to worry about building any kind of shelter from rain. It was a rare respite from the foul weather, and it meant they wouldn't need to build shelters. It was already so late into the night that they would get precious little sleep as it was. Most of the men had had a quick bite of rations and were already asleep. Watches had been posted, but Colin felt unusually safe where they were camped. Once they had crossed the chasm, they had sent the bridge to its grave in the darkness below. She felt better with a physical barrier between them and any shuntuck who could theoretically still be alive. She had been there right at the edge of the devastation as stone walls of the gorge had fallen in and nearly found herself right under it. She knew better than any of the rest of them the massive violence of what had taken place. She found it very hard to believe that anyone under those falling cliffs could have lived through it. Even if they had, that didn't mean they could ever claw their way out from under all that rock. They were buried under half a mountain, and if any were still alive, they would die a slow death of starvation, if nothing else. If the rubble dammed up the brook, it would build up the water level, and anyone trapped under there would drown. Of course, Emperor Sulachan and Hannes Ark would eventually send more half-people to track their spirits. Perhaps even more frightening, that was not their worst problem. Because she felt safe in their camp for the time being, she hadn't objected too strongly when the commander told her that she wasn't allowed to stand watch. He told her that she had fought as much as ten men, and he wanted her to get some sleep so she would be rested in case he needed her to fight for them again. He said she was too valuable with the sword while Richard was still unconscious, and he wanted her to be rested and ready to fight. She had made a show of objecting, but only a small show. By the smile she caught when he turned to walk away, he knew full well that her objections had only been for show. In truth, she was dead tired and would make a very poor sentry. She thought she would probably fall asleep standing up. Although she was dead tired, she was also famished. The protracted fighting, 
from their original encampment and then all the way up the gorge, had taken a lot of energy, and she needed to have something before she lay down and went to sleep. It was too late to cook, so everyone had to be satisfied with traveling rations. Zed had been eating one thing or another since they had found the campsite and finally stopped. He seemed perfectly content with the available fare. The bridge building had been surprisingly quick. The men with axes had the arms to swing them, and they felled the trees in no time. They were experienced at woodcutting and laid the two main trees down right across the chasm, tight beside each other. Zed helped with the task, or at least he said he did. She thought the men knew what they were doing. While some of the men crossed over to scout, others walked along the logs, using their axes to clean off any branches that would be in the way. Another two trees were felled along the edge of the chasm, cut into lengths, and then split into planks to lay a roadbed for the horse. It also made crossing safer for all the rest of them as well, rather than balancing on a log over an abyss in the middle of the night. The horse hadn't been especially eager, but with the blindfold and Zed trickling calming magic into the animal as he murmured soft words of comfort to it, the crossing had been both swift and uneventful. For the first time in quite a while, Colin felt safe. Richard had been laid out comfortably. Colin would have slept next to him, but Zed and Niki wanted to snatch a bit of sleep, lying to either side of him until they were rested enough to be able to work on him. Colin didn't want to interfere with them doing as they must. In the moonlight, she looked over at Richard not far away. Zed was sitting up beside his grandson, munching on a length of sausage. Niki lay beside Richard, already fast asleep, an arm draped over his chest, comforted by his slow breathing and knowing that he was still alive. Not far beyond, Samantha was dead asleep beside her mother. Irina had her knees pulled up, her arms hugging them as she watched over the camp. Occasionally, she took a few bites of dried biscuit to suck on. It had been so late that Colin had not had time to discuss with Irina the astonishing things her daughter had done. Irina had seemed strangely incurious about it. Colin figured that maybe she feared to know. Some people liked things to go on unchanged and for their children to remain perpetually children. Colin suspected that might be at least part of the reason for Samantha's apparent lack of training as a sorceress. Richard had said that Samantha seemed to have received less instruction in her ability than he had heard was normal with sorceresses. Some people, like Richard, never received any training about their gift. In Richard's case, he had never been told that he was born gifted in order to protect and hide him from those bent on destroying him. Colin, on the other hand, had been instructed, trained, and disciplined in everything surrounding her powers from as early as she could remember, so that she could protect herself from those bent on destroying her. Though completely opposite experiences, they both seemed the right choices for them. After all, Zed had his reasons for hiding and protecting Richard from any knowledge of his ability, while Colin's mother had hers for insisting on rigorous education. Samantha also seemed to know very little of the lonely mission of her people, especially the gifted in the remote village of Stroiza. Perhaps over the millennia, her people had lost touch with that mission and the purpose of the barrier. Once Richard was awake, they were going to have to question Irina to find out if there was anything she knew that could help them. What had been locked away behind that barrier for thousands of years was now again loose in the world, and they had precious little knowledge of how to stop it before it was too late. Colin scanned the camp and saw that the men were settled and quiet. She was so relieved that so few of their men had been lost, and that they had escaped, that she felt like breaking down in tears. But she didn't. Instead, she unwrapped an oiled cloth with dried meat, a chunk of hard sausage, and some salted fish. She guzzled water from a water skin to wash down the first piece of fish. She wasn't especially fond of dried meat or salted fish, but right then, it was a feast she savored. She was saving the flavorful smoked sausage for last. When she thought she heard a kind of soft murmuring, purring sound, she looked up. There, on top of the rock she was leaning against, she found herself looking into the big green eyes of a crouched creature. It hunkered silently, staring at her. Chapter 32 Collins chewing paused, her hand holding a piece of dried meat still halfway to her mouth. 
The animal was at least two or three times the size of a regular cat, with the same kind of almond-shaped eyes. In the moonlight, she could see that its tan back was covered in darkly spotted fur, becoming darker down toward its haunches and shoulders. It was broader than a typical cat, something like a wolverine or badger, with muscular shoulders, but it didn't have the long nose or short legs of one of those animals. The head was more like that of a cougar, with a heavier brow. The fur was short as well. Whatever it was, she had never seen anything quite like it. Since the animal was sitting peacefully and wasn't showing any signs of aggression, her initial alarm relaxed a bit. The fingers of her left hand, though, touched the handle of the knife sheathed at her belt, making sure the weapon was there and easy to get at quickly. The animal's ears swiveled, tracking the smallest movement of her left hand as she checked that her knife was handy. The long, pointed ears had tufts of fur at the ends. It had whiskers something like a cat's. Its legs looked considerably stockier than those of any cat she had ever seen. Its paws were disproportionately huge. A lot of animals had big feet or paws when they were immature and grew into them, making Colin think that the creature was possibly young. But that wasn't always true, so she couldn't be sure. The creature looked up at her with big green eyes and then looked down at the food she was holding. The eyes beneath a heavy brow had the same kind of vertical slit in the iris as a cat's. It had an expressive face that almost told her what it was thinking with the calm confidence in its own abilities that gave it a curious but relaxed posture. Its ears perked toward her. It apparently found her interesting and worthy of investigation. You have green eyes like me, she said softly. The creature purred louder at the sound of her voice and squeezed its eyes closed for a second. It looked at her again and then inched forward in a cautious crouch, trying to sniff the dried meat in her hand, judging the distance should it decide to lunge. Colin held up the piece. Would you like one? The animal looked up at her, as if it understood her words. It clearly wanted the food, but it was also being cautious. So as not to frighten the creature, Colin stayed where she was as she slowly stretched her arm out to offer the piece of meat. The animal also stretched, leaning forward on its powerful-looking forelegs, its nose twitching as it smelled her hand all the way around. She could see the muscles rippling under the sleek fur of its shoulders. Satisfied, it then smelled the meat, and finally carefully lifted the piece of the meat from her fingers. When it took the meat, she saw that it had a broad mouth of long, needle-sharp, and quite formidable teeth. Watching her the whole time, it dragged the prize back a short distance and hunched over, gnawing at it very much the way a cat hunched over food as it ate. Colin used her teeth to tear off a piece of her own and chewed as she watched the animal, letting it know she was hungry too. As happy as the creature was to take the hand out, it certainly looked like it was getting enough to eat. By the looks of it, it was built for hunting. By its robust build, it was clearly successful at it. The dark spots on its back seemed to grow together the farther down they went along the side of the body and up onto the neck. The fur on the head, legs, and big paws was very dark. In the moonlight, it was hard to tell if it was dark brown or black. Since the light-colored area on the back under the spots was tan, she guessed that it was probably dark brown. The one exception was the almost white tufts of hair at the points of its ears. When it finished, the animal looked up and started purring again, content where it was, not yet ready to leave. Still hungry? Colin asked with a smile as she offered it another piece. It took the second piece with equal care and withdrew a short distance to gnaw at the second prize. Colin drank water after another piece of salted fish. The animal watched out of the corner of an eye. Colin lifted her water skin. You thirsty, little one? The creature just watched her with big green eyes. It seemed interested in everything she did, appraising every movement. Its ears perked toward her. Colin poured some water into her cupped hand and held it out. The animal rose up a little and moved forward and crouched down to greedily lap at the water with a rough, cat-like tongue. When it finished, Colin poured a second handful as it waited and watched. It drank most of the second handful, finally seeming satisfied. Colin offered it a third piece of meat. 
When it rose up and stepped forward, she saw that it favored its front left paw. This time it stayed close as it gnawed the meat in two before swallowing down half of it. As it picked up the other half to gulp it down, it lifted its weight off its front left paw. It seemed less afraid after having the snack, so Colin cautiously reached out and with a single finger stroked the sable-soft fur on the foreleg that it held partially up off the rock. Do you have something wrong with your foot, little one? It backed away. Moving slowly and deliberately, Colin reached out toward the paw. Can I take a look? Maybe I can help. The animal stayed in place, tipping its head down, watching her hand as she gently lifted the paw. With her thumb, she stroked the top of the paw while slipping her fingers under the big soft pads. She felt the sharp points of a burr lodged between the toes. The fur was wet where the animal had been licking at it and probably trying to get it out with its teeth. It would feel better if you would let me take that out for you. Would you let me? She knew that the creature couldn't understand her, but by the way it continued to purr, she thought that maybe it found her soft voice comforting. Since the animal wasn't going to come closer, she turned a little and got up on her knees so she could lean closer and see. With her one hand, she carefully spread the toes and saw the thorny burr lodged between the two of them. That has to hurt to walk on. It's not going to kill you, but why don't you let me see if I can get it out? She cooed. It would feel better. The thing watched her without showing any reaction, but she was well aware of how close that wide mouth full of teeth was to her face. Other than its thrumming purr, it was as silent as a cat when it moved. Not wanting the wicked-looking thorns stuck in her own fingers, Colin grabbed a nearby stick and bent it in half with the fingers of one hand to use as pincers. She leaned in on her elbows, holding the toes spread with one hand, while she worked her thumb and finger on the stick with her other hand to start to pull the burr out. It was one of those small spheres with thorns all around, and it was lodged tightly in place. The animal's purr changed to a low, gurgling whimper as she rocked the burr, trying to pull it out. She hoped that what she was hearing wasn't a growl. The burr was stuck fast. Its heavy brow drawing down, ears forward, the animal started pulling the paw back away from her grip on it. She looked up into the green eyes, only inches away from hers. I need to pull it out, all right? Let me help you. The animal tugged once, but then stopped trying to take the paw back. Colin took that as consent. Despite the frowning look, she was pretty sure that it understood she was trying to help. She pulled harder, trying to draw the burr out. She could see the skin being tugged outward, stuck on the hooked tips of the thorns. The creature let out a soft wail of pain, but didn't move, so she yanked. The thorn finally came out. Colin pressed a thumb over the bloody spot a moment to soften the sting. She held the thorn up to show the creature and distract it from the hurt. See? It's out now. All better. As she let go of the paw, the animal leaned in and sniffed the offending thorn burr and stretched out its front legs with its chest against the ground and its haunches high in the air. As it stretched, it flexed its paws against the rock and Colin saw that it had claws that were just as formidable as its teeth. Finally finished stretching, it turned and walked off toward the woods with that silent, relaxed, loping gait of a cat. As it left, she saw that it had a very short, flat, bobbed tail. She also saw that it was a male. The animal paused to look back over a shoulder at Colin for a moment, then silently hopped down off the rock and into the woods. Without making a sound, it vanished in a heartbeat. Colin smiled as she lay down, happy that she had given the beautiful little mountain cat, or whatever it was, a nice meal, and rid it of the thorn burr in its paw. Despite how warm a night it had been at first, once the clouds had broken up, it had started turning colder. Colin wrapped the small blanket over herself as best she could. She curled up on her side, holding the blanket over her shoulder, trying to keep warm so she could sleep. She was exhausted. She thought about Richard, thought about so many things about him. Despite her worry for him, she knew that Zed had promised to bring him awake. So she felt somewhat confident. She felt herself drifting off with fits of images flashing through her mind's eye. She was asleep in moments. 
At some point in the night, Colin woke up. Chapter 33 Colin squinted as she glanced up and saw that the moon had moved quite a distance across the sky. Dawn was still several hours off. Even partially submerged in sleep, Colin was awake enough to realize that she felt warm and comfortable. That didn't make a lot of sense. Concerned for the reason and at how odd it seemed, she forced herself awake in order to figure it out. It was then that she realized she felt something soft and warm against her middle. Colin was astonished to find the furry creature curled up in a ball, sleeping spooned against her stomach. Its back was to her, its head tucked under the big paw that was now thorn-free. Colin smiled at the unexpected comfort of her little friend nested up with her as she slept. With it pressed tight against her, she realized that it wasn't all that little. It was actually a pretty good size, with a landscape of firm muscles under the silken fur. Colin gently put her hand over it. The fur was short and as soft as sable. The fur was so soft to the touch that she yearned to work her fingers deep into it, but resisted for fear of scaring the animal off, so instead she gently stroked his shoulder and back before letting her hand come to rest on the warm fur, feeling the rise and fall of its even breathing. The paw moved a little as the eye opened to peer up at who was stroking its back. When it saw Colin, the eye slowly closed. It readjusted itself slightly and put the paw back over its face. Since it purred a little louder and made no effort to get away from her hand, Colin was pretty sure that it was content with her touch. That purr was unusual sounding. It was a more husky sound than a cat made, almost growly. But then she knew that this was no typical cat. It was then that she noticed something else in the moonlight. Atop the rock, three dead rabbits had been laid out neatly side by side in a row. Although freshly killed, none had been eaten. The creature had brought her a gift. Colin looked down at the animal curled up against her middle. Now I know your name. Hunter, she said softly, but with emphasis. Hunter fits you. She stroked behind a tufted ear. Hunter sound good to you? Hunter's only response was to purr a little louder. She could feel the vibration of that contented purr against her stomach. Colin laid her head back down, her hand resting on little Hunter's back, feeling his even breathing and the soft, steady throbbing of his purr. She smiled as she recalled Richard once admonishing her not to name wild creatures. He had brought her a jar of little fish one time to entertain her while she was recovering from terrible injuries. He had told her not to name them. It wasn't long before she and Kara had named them all. Sleep well, Hunter. Colin couldn't help smiling as she fell back to sleep. Chapter 34 Ludwig Dreyer's gaze drifted around the cramped, narrow streets of Saavedra as he and Erica rode their horses up through the city toward the citadel. Two-story buildings packed with people in cramped apartments crowded in close to the muddy road. Small shops or work areas filled some of the lower floors, while carts and vendor stands stood wedged between buildings or in alleyways. Some were covered with tarps to protect the goods of hopeful merchants from the light drizzle. Ludwig had been to Saavedra to visit the citadel a number of times over the years, and he rather liked the feel of the city. And he liked the way it smelled. It smelled of fear. The people of Saavedra feared the citadel on the hill looking down on them, watching them. Actually, it had been Hannes Ark watching them, and Hannes Ark they feared. The citadel was merely a symbol that embodied those fears. Hannes Ark believed that fear equaled respect, so most everything he did was aimed at earning their full and complete respect. The bishop had believed that if people feared him, they respected him, they obeyed him, they bowed down to him. He made sure that people were never without cause to fear him. Ludwig Dreyer leaned over in his saddle and spat to the side. Hannes Ark was nothing but a petty despot, the ruler of the pathetic little land of Fajin province, proud of himself for the way he could instill fear. And because of that, he thought himself respected and worthy of more. He thought himself worthy of an empire. Because the dark lands were such a dangerous place, 
people were drawn to Saavedra for protection from those dangers. Those people needed food, clothing, and a myriad of other things, which drew in yet more people to service those needs and every other sort of need, from butchers to bakers to healers to merchants to woodcutters to prostitutes. All those people found shelter and relative safety in Saavedra, but it made the whole city feel like it was hunched inward, cowering in fear of everything out in the dark forests beyond and the citadel watching over them. Such fears, both the external and the internal, were wholly justified. Hannes Ark, if nothing else, was a man of considerable occult talent, and in return for their respect, he protected the people of his province in general and Saavedra in particular from things even less forgiving than he was. While they lived in fear of the man, at least they lived. Out in the wilds of the Darklands, people died easily, swiftly and often. There were claws and fangs always ready to take the careless, or even the properly cautious. But there were also things out there that were far worse than claws and fangs always ready to take them when they least expected it. The Dark Lands was mostly a deserted, trackless waste for good reason. So, people wanted to live in Saavedra or places like it as salvation from those very real dangers beyond the expanse of dark forests. Weighed in that light, Hannes Ark was a leader they were more than willing to tolerate. Not that they had any real choice in the matter. As Ludwig knew so well, if given a choice, people always chose the less painful of their options. It was the task of an intelligent leader to limit and properly frame those options so that people could see those choices in stark terms. The people walking in every direction on the narrow street scattered out of the way when Ludwig and Erica made no effort to take any care in guiding their horses among them. If people didn't get out of the way, that was their problem. He was in no mood to indulge inconsiderate people not paying attention to where they were walking. It was their choice to get stepped on by a huge horse or pay attention and get out of the way. His mind was on dark thoughts about the tasks that lay ahead. People stared at him because they recognized his black coat buttoned to his neck, the straight collar closed at his throat, and his rimless, four-sided hat. Even if they hadn't seen him before, they would have heard of him. They knew by his distinctive clothes that he could be none other than Bishop Ark's abbot. They knew that Ludwig ran the abbey, and the abbey was one of those places out in the vast forests beyond the city that they rightfully feared. Ludwig Dreyer smiled as he suddenly realized that he, too, was respected. The men and women on the street also stared because Mistress Erica rode beside him. The stunningly beautiful creature, her posture perfect as she swayed easily in her saddle, was worthy of more than a long look. But most people averted their eyes the first instant they recognized her for what she was and then quickly made themselves scarce. Those who did not look away quickly enough risked finding themselves looking into her cold, blue-eyed gaze. A moored Sith in black leather was more than enough on her own to make people scatter without the horses urging them to move. Much like the abbot himself, people didn't want a moored Sith taking note of them, especially not a moored Sith as intimidating as Erica. They believed such a woman's gaze was capable of weighing their very soul. Ludwig Dreyer smiled to himself because that fear was closer to the truth than people realized. Erica was a moored Sith who was more than merely talented at her craft. Others he had used were bumbling oafs in comparison to Erica. Their clumsy ability could hardly be compared to her talents. Erica was an artist. She could hold a person at the cusp of death for days on end, suspended between the world of life and the world of the dead, from where, when Ludwig Dreyer applied his own occult abilities, those people could look into the dark, timeless depths of the underworld and then draw from that dark well 
to trade him prophecy in exchange for the favor of finally being allowed to cross over and escape the pain that was all that life and Erica had left to offer them. Demoralized people, once their choices were properly framed for them, begged for death, knowing full well that death was their only escape from Mistress Erica. When Ludwig Dreyer added the final occult ingredients, they were more than willing to trade the task he asked of them in exchange for that escape. In that way, Ludwig considered himself an agent of the grace. He carried them along that thread of the gift coming from the heart of the grace, and eventually across the boundary between life and death. But Ludwig Dreyer's days as an abbot were over. That was merely a phase of his past, a period of edification, a stepping stone to his wider future. He had always been considerably more than a mere abbot. No one recognized that, of course, especially Hannes Ark, but he was. In his modest occupation as the loyal abbot, he had remained inconspicuous and unnoticed from where he observed and learned as he waited. That anonymity was a powerful tool he used to leverage his inborn ability into powers he had kept hidden. Until now. Ludwig had been content to spend years in obscurity honing his craft and making his plans. All the while, he helped Hannes Ark toward the man's wider goals. Ludwig helped him because it served Ludwig's own plans, and for no other reason. Ludwig had been born close to the profound occult powers contained for thousands of years beyond the Great Barrier to the north. All of that occult power could not be contained forever, and the barrier had failed to prevent it from occasionally escaping, even before the barrier itself had finally failed completely. Ludwig had always known that at least some of his innate ability had been a result of those powers slipping through the barrier, unnoticed, and settling in his spark of life at conception. That had been the source of much of Hannes Ark's ability, as well as many of the lesser talents of some of the cunning folk out in the wilds of the Darklands. But Ludwig had such abilities as well and in greater abundance, augmenting his gift. For that reason, his abilities and his powers were unique, even if they had remained unrecognized all this time. He supposed that he had that in common with Richard Rawl. Lord Rawl had grown up completely unaware of his latent abilities. No one recognized those powers in him, much the same as no one recognized them in Ludwig Dreyer except that in Ludwig's case, he had been self-aware of his abilities. On his own, keeping to himself, he had studied, worked on, and developed those abilities. Hannes Ark wore those ancient abilities he had been born with on his sleeve, literally, in the form of his tattoos. He wanted the world to see him standing out. Ludwig Dreyer chose to keep his ability concealed until the time was right. With much of his planning coming to fruition, the time was finally right. Hannes Ark was an agent of chaos, thinking that creating disorder and turmoil would make him powerful. But Ludwig understood that true power accrued to the one who could step into a world swamped by chaos and galvanize the masses to lift him up as the champion of a new order that they so desperately needed. At such a point, Given the choices Ludwig would carefully frame for them, whatever order they were offered by him would be embraced as salvation compared to a world crumbling around them at Hannes Ark's hands. Hannes Ark believed himself the one who would create a new world order by fundamentally changing the nature of life. In reality, Ludwig had actually been the one who had helped Bishop Ark from the beginning to break the world apart to start sending it spiraling out of control and into chaos. And Ludwig would be the one who was there to put the pieces back together for people desperate for a savior. But he would put things back together his way. It had all been going well, according to that plan, until the Spirit King brought information to Hannes Ark from the underworld, telling him of the things Ludwig had been doing and what he had been planning all along. 
The two of them had sent the savages, the half-people, to extract vengeance by eliminating Ludwig. Ludwig Dreyer possessed profound powers, but even such powers had their limits. He was still only one man and could be overwhelmed by numbers such as the half-people had. Hannes Ark and Sulachan had surprised him. They caught him off guard, and they had almost crushed him. Oddly enough, and fortunately enough, Richard Rawl, of all people, had shown up to rescue his wife before Ludwig and Erica could begin their work on her. Ludwig imagined that the Mother Confessor could unlock profoundly important prophecy. He had been particularly interested in working with her, but Lord Rawl and his troops had arrived just in time to ruin those plans. They had also been just in time to encounter the rampaging half-people sent to assassinate Ludwig. The Lord Rawl had been so kind as to eliminate the savages, saving Ludwig and Erica from the fate Hannes Ark and the spirit Sulachan had intended for them. Sometimes chaos, once set in motion, worked against its agent. Ludwig had been the one who had helped Hannes Ark with prophecy in order for him to bring the long-dead Emperor Sulachan back from the world of the dead so he could fundamentally change the nature of the world. Ludwig thought that reviving the dead to again fight a failed war was unwise. But it served his purposes, so he had helped the bishop in his single-minded task. In part with the help of pivotal prophecy that Ludwig had provided, Hannes Ark had been able to bring the long-dead Emperor Sulachan back to the world of life. Neither trusted the other one bit, but both believed they were getting the better end of the deal by far. So for the time being, they were trusting companions, the best of chums. Ludwig imagined that each of them smiled amicably, inwardly believing that in the end he would cut the other's throat and be the last one standing. For now, Ludwig didn't care about their plans. Actually, it benefited him for the two of them to focus on each other as they initiated the world's fall into chaos. That chaos was, after all, one of the choices Ludwig needed to offer people. The most undesirable choice, of course. Ludwig was content to leave them to it. It would keep them busy for the time being. Ludwig had his own work to do. After barely escaping the Abbey with his life, he needed to establish a new place from which to work and set in motion his own plans. With the Citadel only just recently vacated by Hannes Ark in his rush to be off after bigger things, it made the perfect place for Ludwig to establish his new base and at last begin multiplying his power. Hannes Ark hated being confined to the distant and forgotten Fajin province in the dirty little city of Saavedra. He had no intentions of ever coming back to the place. Hannes Ark had his eye on the People's Palace. He viewed himself as worthy of the seat of power for the Daharan Empire. He wanted revenge against the House of Rawl. His eyes were filled with visions of vanquishing the House of Rawl and taking rule for himself. As part of his vision, he wanted to rule in their place from the Grand People's Palace, the ancestral home of the House of Rawl. Ludwig had been to the wedding of one of Lord Rawl's Mord Sith. The People's Palace was certainly grand on a scale unparalleled as far as Ludwig knew. He supposed it was impressive if you went in for that sort of thing. He didn't. He wanted to live in the minds of his subjects, to rule from the perspective of their every conscious thought, not from a cold marble palace. He would live in people's minds, not their palace. Hannes Ark was instead fixated on basking in the glittering glory of the palace. What made the citadel so undesirable to Hannes Ark made it the perfect spot for Ludwig Dreyer to establish himself. It was a nearly forgotten place. No one would think to look for him there, least of all Hannes Ark. Hannes Ark, after all, thought he had eliminated his abbot. No one would interfere or bother Ludwig as he went about his work. One day, though, everyone would come to know him and eagerly take the choice he offered them, order rather than chaos. That was what would make him powerful, people choosing to have him rule over them. 
Hannah's Ark thought that one ruled through fear. Ludwig understood that, ultimately, one ruled people only with their consent. Through the choices he would shape and offer them, they would embrace his rule. It mattered not to Ludwig where that process started. Ruling the citadel, Saavedra, and Fajin province was a perfectly satisfactory place to start. It was too small for the likes of Hannes Ark to bother with, or even to think about. But one day, people would think about it. And then they would wish they had bothered. In his position as abbot, Ludwig had extracted prophecies and passed important ones along to Hannes Ark at the citadel. The ones he wanted Hannes Ark to see, anyway. Hannes Ark was a pompous ass. He had no idea that Ludwig Dreyer was spoon-feeding him what Dreyer wanted him to know. By the way the people on the streets were staring at him, Ludwig realized that the time had come for a new wardrobe, one more befitting his new importance. He was a careful man and didn't make a move without knowing the outcome before he started. He never started a fight unless he knew he could win. Now it was time to start. It was time to establish rule over his new foothold. Hannes Ark had done him a considerable favor by abandoning the citadel and leaving him the beginnings of an armed force. As powerful as his occult power might be, he was still only one man. He needed protection and men to watch his back while he devoted himself to greater things. Ludwig Dreyer turned his horse up the cobbled main road toward the Fajin garrison headquarters and the citadel beyond that those soldiers protected. Chapter 35 As Ludwig walked his horse between the gates and into the cobblestone square outside the Fajin garrison, he got his first close glimpse of the citadel higher up above them. Erica rode beside him, half a length behind, his ever-present protection. For now, his only protection. He would soon have more. He was pleased to see that the troops had been alerted to his approach and had already set up massive defensive positions. That was the kind of response he would want to defend himself against non-gifted threats. Since these men knew him, it was a rather respectful show of arms. The soldiers were all out in the open, standing in formation. The slick, wet cobblestone reflected the neat array of lances held out at a uniform angle, but with their butts resting on the ground. It was a cautious defensive line, but he was at least glad to see that they were trusting of no one, not even the bishop's abbot, probably the highest-ranking person in Fajin province after the bishop himself. Of course, Hannes Ark never favored other people holding positions of power. Hannes Ark viewed his talents as sufficient to rule Fajin province without the need of other high-ranking officials. He thought such powerful people might cause him trouble. He tolerated his abbot because Ludwig was smart enough to make himself seem insignificant. To either side as they rode in, men in brown tunics lined the way into the square. In the square, beyond the men lining the road, were formations of men set in ranks at an angle designed to funnel the visitors to a central point of the square. The men in the front row of those ranks wore chain mail. Their swords remained sheathed but at the ready. The second row of men behind them held the angled lances. On one knee in front of the men in chain mail were the archers, arrows knocked, but strings not drawn back. All of the preparations were protective stances, ready, but not openly threatening or aggressive to the visitor. The formations were also designed to place the visitors in the center of the square, where they could swiftly be surrounded if necessary, with any route of escape cut off. It was also meant to be a clear signal that any unwelcome actions from anyone would not be tolerated. Officers blocked the open center of the funnel formation leading to the road beyond that went the rest of the way up to the citadel. Since the officers knew him, they stood openly in the key position to block him. They probably thought it would be better if commanding officers turned him away, rather than a lowly foot soldier. Had it been a threat rather than Bishop Ark's abbot, the opening would be totally closed off, and the officers would likely have been somewhere in the rear, directing the men at turning away or eliminating the threat. Beyond the ranks of soldiers in the square, 
tiered terraces, each with shaggy olive trees, stepped up the rising hillside toward the grounds around the citadel at the top. It was an attempt at an imposing entrance to the seat of power in the sorry little land of Fajin province. These men were protecting that pathetic seat of power, as if it were a great prize. Ludwig smiled. In this case, it just so happened that from now on, it was going to be just that. The four men of rank stood almost shoulder to shoulder, blocking the opening flanked by men with lances, swords, and bows at the ready. Since Bishop Ark had likely left instructions that no one was to enter the citadel in his absence, these men intended to guard the crown jewel of Saavedra. Ludwig sighed inwardly. Bishop Ark had, of course, never considered his abbot to be anything other than his loyal minion. No one, really, other than those from whom he gained prophecy, considered Ludwig to be at all dangerous. It was not until after Hannes Ark had left the citadel that he came to see Ludwig as a threat and sent half-people to assassinate him. That had been a mistake, because Hannes Ark had not counted on Richard Rawl showing up. Hannes Ark expected his loyal abbot to carry out his duties, but he never paid much attention to how he accomplished those duties. Hannes Ark assumed that his abbot brought gifted people and some of the cunning folk to the abbey to investigate any prophecy about which they might have knowledge. The bishop never really knew how his abbot collected such a wealth of prophecy, or the work involved, or the talent it had taken. Hannes Ark never realized the powers that Ludwig Dreyer possessed. No one, really, with the exception of those he worked closely with, such as Erica, had any idea of the abilities Ludwig Dreyer kept hidden. Ludwig had never trumpeted his talents. He never thought it was a good idea to be boastful and show off the way Hannes Ark did. Ludwig's abilities were his own business. He used them as necessary without drawing attention to himself. Because of that, few people had ever had any real understanding of the powers he wielded. He thought that it was about time they started to come to understand. Ludwig and Erica could, of course, have simply charged their horses through the four officers, but that would have brought an obnoxious hail of arrows at their backs. Ludwig could have dealt with those, but it would not have served to further his goal to shape choices. These men would prove useful once he established the new order of things in Fajin province. Abbot Dreyer? General Dobson asked. What are you doing here? We weren't told to expect you. Ludwig Dreyer calmly stared at the man, letting the silence grow uncomfortable. The general finally felt compelled to speak up again. As trusted an aide as you might be to Bishop Ark, he has left very specific instructions. I'm afraid that in his absence we can't allow you to visit the Citadel. So, if you would be so kind, please turn around and go back down into the city. You will find accommodations there. Better yet, you would be well advised to go home to your abbey and stay there until the bishop returns and summons you. Or what? Ludwig asked with a small smile. You going to have your archer shoot me out of my saddle, are you? Unaccustomed to such a confrontation from the bishop's abbot, the big general scowled. If I have to. My orders are that no one is allowed to visit until further notice. Ah, well, then. Problem solved. Ludwig lifted an arm in a grand, sweeping gesture. Notice is hereby given. Now, step aside, general. The man's scowl deepened. To each side, Ludwig saw all the bowstrings drawn back. He sat calmly, letting his horse paw at the wet cobblestones. I'm afraid that you don't have the authority to give any such notice, Abbot. Ludwig readjusted himself in the saddle. Well, now, there you are simply wrong. You see, I am no longer the Abbot serving the Citadel. I am now Lord Dreyer, and I am in charge at the Citadel. Lord Dreyer? the general asked with a derisive snort. Lord Dreyer? I don't think so. Ludwig's smile faded. I suggest that you rethink it while you still can. You can either serve as my general in charge of my troops, or you will be replaced. Last chance given, General Dobson. 
Make your choice carefully. The burly general took a step forward and planted his fists on his hips. Or what? He gestured up at Erica. You will send your moored Sith down here to teach me to respect you? Well, the thing is, Ludwig said almost apologetically, clearing his throat as he leaned down toward the man a bit. Mistress Erica has been riding hard all day, and I'm afraid that the poor girl is far too exhausted to climb down off her horse just to teach you some respect. He turned to Erica. Isn't that right, my dear? Erica's smooth face showed no reaction as she sat tall in her saddle while her horse danced around a little under her. No, Lord Dreyer, it isn't. She pulled her long, blonde braid over the front of her shoulder, stroking a hand down the length of it. I'm feeling quite fine, and nothing would please me more than to dismount and teach this pig to show you proper respect. Ludwig held an arm out toward her as he spoke to the general. There, you see? The poor girl is simply far too exhausted from her long ride to carry out such a chore. Ludwig smiled. So I will have to do it myself. Chapter 36 the general took another step forward as he flicked a finger in command at the archers. Without looking, Ludwig heard the whoosh as all the bows ignited in the hands of the men before they could loose their arrows, and then the sounds of the weapons rattling against the cobblestone as they were thrown to the ground before they could burn the hands of the archers. He never took his gaze from the general's increasingly red face, but he did lift a finger of his own, pointing. What's that there, general? At the corner of your mouth. It looks like you are bleeding. The man was so angry that he hadn't even noticed yet. What? Ludwig gestured again. There, at the corners of your mouth. Isn't that blood starting to run down your chin? The general swiped at his jaw and looked down at his hand to see it covered in blood. You seem to have caught a disease or something. I believe I do recall hearing about some sort of illness that has been befalling people. Quite painful, from the accounts I've heard. The officers to either side began stepping forward, but Ludwig shot them a glare. I don't think you want to get close to the man. He looks quite infectious. He lifted a cautionary finger. It could possibly be the plague. I would hate for anyone else to catch the horrifying sickness your commanding general appears to have contracted. The officers paused, uncertain about what to do. The soldiers stared in horror at the man. The general's face was almost as red as the strings of blood that had begun dripping from his chin. Dryer, the general shouted. How dare you? His voice trailed off in a choking gurgle. I am so sorry to have to tell you, general, but your symptoms appear to match the terrible disease I've been hearing about. When I heard the stories, I had thought it might be nothing more than the rumors of country folk, but those rumors appear to be proving true. From what I have been told, it comes on swiftly, first with sores bursting open in the mouth and throat. Such sores are said to bleed profusely. The general's hands went to his throat. His eyes looked nearly ready to pop from his head. Blood splattered all over the wet cobblestones at his feet. From what I've heard of this disease, Ludwig said as he turned his eyes skyward while tapping his chin as if trying to recall, the second set of symptoms set in quite rapidly. What? The man coughed out a spray of blood, unable to ask what symptoms. I've heard that soon after the sores burst, the bones themselves that have become brittle from the malady start breaking. It is said that the ones holding up the most weight, like the leg bones, go first. A loud snap echoed around the courtyard. It was quickly followed by a second. As both of his lower legs broke, the general dropped heavily to his knees. From what I've heard tell, Ludwig went on, it quickly becomes a rapid progression from there to the embrittled bones all over the body breaking. Quite a horrifying thought, actually, considering how many bones there are in the human body. I'm afraid that I don't know the number, but I've heard there are a lot of them. Ludwig turned to the men in ranks to his left. Any of you know the number of bones in the human body? They all shook their heads. Ludwig shrugged. Well, don't hold me to it, but I seem to recall that the number might be over a hundred. Possibly two. All the men now hung on his every word. 
They watched in horror as their general held his throat while vomiting blood. Intermittently, more loud snaps reverberated through the drizzle of the courtyard. The general collapsed onto his side. Quite painful, I heard tell, the way they just keep breaking, one at a time. Ludwig said. He let out a deep sigh. I think I recall hearing that the next thing that happens is that the mere act of breathing is too much for the now brittle bones of the ribs, and they all break. With that, there is a rapid, ripping succession of pops, like a fistful of dry twigs snapping. The general gasped and choked as his feet kicked wildly at the end of broken legs. His muscles could no longer move his broken limbs properly, so the effort made them flop around. Well now, Ludwig said in feigned, concerned observation, you do seem to exhibit the symptoms I've heard about. You seem to have contracted the plague of fools. The men, standing in stiff panic, glanced at one another, not knowing what to do, not daring to move as they watched the general going through the terrifying throes of a painful death. Enough of this, Ludwig said, his patience spent. He flicked out a hand. In the gloom of the drizzly afternoon, there was a dull red flash deep within the general's chest that could be seen through his body and heavy uniform. In an instant, the man's flesh turned black as coal. In the next instant, his blackened body seemed to break apart from great pressure and disintegrate into small black nuggets, looking something like fragments of charcoal. In the next heartbeat, that body, now nothing but blackened bits, crumbled and poured out of the openings in the man's uniform. Some of the dark, jagged pieces of what had been General Dobson tumbled out, bouncing across the cobblestones. Everyone stood rigid and still, unsure just what they should do. It was now time for Lord Dreyer to offer them the choice he had just so carefully crafted. Ludwig folded his wrists over the horn of his saddle. Who is next in command? Two of the remaining officers took a step away from the third officer left in the middle. He glanced at the men to either side as they distanced themselves from him. He finally swallowed and said, I guess that would be me. Lord Dreyer, I am Lieutenant Wolsey. Ludwig smiled. It would seem, Lieutenant, that the Citadel Guard of the Fijin Army is in need of a general. I appoint you. Congratulations, General Wolsey. The man blinked in surprise, but he hesitated only for an instant before clapping a fist to his heart and bowing deeply. He knew his life had been spared, at least for the moment. He made his choice. Thank you, Lord Dreyer. Let us all pray that you and your men do not contract the same fatal disease afflicting your former general. I would hate for any more of you to fall ill. You are feeling healthy, aren't you, general? You are in good shape and prepared to carry out your duties? The man nodded furiously. Yes, of course, Lord Dreyer. I am healthy and totally prepared to carry out my duties under your command. How may my men and I be of assistance? Ludwig glanced to the side. Well, it appears my archers will need new bows. Theirs fortunately fell apart before the men could accidentally do something stupid, like getting themselves burned. Not a problem, Lord Dreyer. Woolsey quickly put in. We have a stock of bows, as well as bow makers and fletchers. I will take care of it immediately, so that they are properly armed and can man their positions defending you and the Citadel. Ludwig looked over at the archers. Is that acceptable to you men? They all jumped to attention and clapped fists to hearts. Anything else I can do to be of assistance, Lord Dreyer? The new general asked. Yes, as a matter of fact, there is. You see, the bishop has gone off on an adventure of some sort. Ludwig wagged a hand vaguely toward the southwest. His nose wrinkled with distaste. I'm afraid that he is destined not to return. So I am now in command of the citadel. I realize that all you men here have wisely chosen to be loyal to me, but you need to see to it that the staff and the rest of the soldiers and guards are made aware of the new head of household. At once, Lord Dreyer, the man said as he bowed. Ludwig leaned forward in his saddle. I would hate it if anyone else were to catch the disease that so tragically afflicted the general. With such a miasma in the air... It could cause great harm to the people of Saavedra and Fajin province. 
such an illness could easily wipe out half the people of a city and drive the rest out into the wilderness. Understand? General Woolsey clapped his fist to his heart as he nodded. Absolutely, Lord Dreyer. I will personally see to it at once. I am certain that everyone will take the utmost care not to catch the same foul sickness that the general so carelessly caught. I will see to it that my men do their duty of enforcing the rule of law. Anyone disrespecting the Lord Dreyer will be dealt with severely, I can assure you. Ludwig flicked a hand at the crumpled pile of bloody uniform with mounds of black pieces that had poured out and others that had rolled across the ground and see to it that this mess is swept up and thrown in the midden heap, where it belongs, will you? At once, Lord Dreyer. The new general snapped his fingers at a man closest to him on the end of the rank of lancers. The man nodded and ran off to get something to clean up the mess. General Woolsey turned back to Ludwig. With your permission, Lord Dreyer, I will take some men, and we will go at once to see that the staff makes preparations and that everything is in order for you. I will see to it that you are well pleased with everything and everyone. Ludwig nodded with satisfaction. Are there any moored Sith remaining at the Citadel? Erica asked. The man immediately bowed. Yes, mistress. Lord Dreyer? Several. Have them assembled inside, she said. Ludwig nodded his agreement. We will need to speak with them. Erica smiled at the prospect as she stroked a hand down the long blonde braid lying over the front of her shoulder. Chapter 37 As Ludwig threw open the towering main doors and entered the grand greeting room of the Citadel, he could see servants in dark gray dresses and crisp white aprons carrying linens and other supplies as they raced through the galleries beyond the stone columns to each side. An older man, down on one knee, fed sticks of wood into one of the two fireplaces in order to build up the flames to help take the dampness out of the air. A few women to the sides in the same gray dresses were throwing back heavy draperies to let in streamers of gray light. Other women of the staff were lighting lamps on side tables to brighten the gloomy room and welcome the new master of the house. At the far end of the grand room, a split staircase led up to balconies running along either side of the room above the galleries supported by the stone columns. Halls and doors up on that level led to different areas of the citadel. Ahead on the balcony level, a single grand staircase in the center beginning with spiraled marble newel posts on each side led up to the top floor, where Ludwig had heard on previous visits were to be found Hannes Ark's main work area and recording room. Soldiers, who had decided to take the choice Lord Dreyer had offered them, also rushed through the gallery and into halls, both on the lower floor and up on the balcony level, to make sure that everyone recognized the new order of things in the Citadel. Ludwig could hear orders being called out in the distance down various passageways. Everyone, it seemed, was rushing about, urgently seeing to it that proper preparations were being made to receive the new lord of the house. Once the draperies had been opened wide, the large windows on the front wall beside the entrance doors let in the gloomy light to show off the rich, deeply colored carpets and tapestries, the tasteful chairs and couches and muted tans, and small, polished mahogany tables near the chairs. A thin haze from the fireplaces hung in the air, adding the pungent aroma of wood smoke to the otherwise musty smell. Ludwig had seen it before and had never been all that impressed. It wasn't that it lacked elegance. It was that the people were what mattered to him. He had never been preoccupied with belongings. His belief was that if you focused on people and gave them the proper attention required, then the possessions would naturally follow. It seemed to him that most people had it backward focusing on the value of mere objects, never getting matters right with the people first, thinking instead that such trappings would convince others that they had attained great power. They had attained only possessions. Rather disappointing, Ludwig commented to Erica. What's disappointing? She asked. That they folded so quickly. I expect you were looking forward to corrective measures. Only when necessary, she said. She clasped her hands behind her back as they stood overlooking the room, watching the servants rush about. Besides, I know your talents, 
so I wasn't all that surprised when you only had to kill one of them before the rest had a change of heart. You do have a way with people. He smiled. Well, I have found that beheading a snake does tend to take the fight out of the rest of it, making it more flexible and easy to handle. Erica nodded as she surveyed the room, taking note of each person she saw. We still have the Mord Sith. Ludwig shrugged, even less trouble. Generals are plentiful, but Mord Sith are valuable, so I am reluctant to be quite that blunt when explaining it to them. Erica gave him a testy side glance. I know these women, Lord Dreyer, she said. I've served with them since we were with Dark and Roll. While I realize that you value the Mord Sith and want to conserve a valuable resource, there is one among these here that I think you should know about. Why is that? She is the kind who will smile to the face of power and cross you behind your back. He cast a dark look her way. You all did that. You all smiled to your master, dark and raw, and served him, but you all left him when his back was turned. To go to a better master, Erica pointed out. When Ludwig let out a small grunt, dismissing the excuse, Erica went on. I took up your offer and willingly turned my loyalty over to you. In your service, you have given me the chance to use my training to fulfill myself as a Mord Sith, more so than Dark and Rawl ever did. You have shown me trust by giving me wide-ranging responsibilities. Since then, in return for that trust in me, have I not proven myself to you, Lord Dreyer? Have I not carried out all of your instructions and satisfied all of your desires, no matter how difficult, how easy, how large, or how small? Have I not kept your secrets? Have I not stood my ground at your side, even in the face of death? When the half-people came flooding into the abbey to assassinate you, I could have left you. You would have been ripped apart by that many soulless ones. I could have left you to them. When you died, my bond to you would be dissolved, and I would have been free. No one would ever have known but me. Instead, I stood with you when you didn't know what to do. I protected you until I could get you away from there with your life. In all of that, have I not proven my loyalty to you? Ludwig's mouth twisted with a pang of guilt for being so quick with an accusation. There had been so many of those bloodthirsty half-people coming for him all at once that he hadn't been able to think clearly. In that bewildering moment, Erica had gotten the two of them out of there and to safety. She had known what to do. She had never before mentioned it or ever asked for any recognition for what she had done. You have, he conceded quietly. You have more than proven yourself, Erica, in every possible way. She smiled, a rare sight other than when using her agile on those who required it. She had the pride of a true Mord Sith and the devotion to duty. He supposed that she had indeed proven that while she had left Dark and Rawl and Hannes Ark, there was good reason, and in turn, she had proven loyal to him. He considered her words about the others, though, realizing that there might be more to it. He didn't like having to worry about a knife in his back, so to speak. So which one, he asked, which one would scheme against me behind my back? The brunette, Alice. She is older than the others, and her braid is longer. As if that is supposed to mean something to the rest of us. She is the one who first suggested we could leave Dark and Rawl, and instead throw our lot in with Bishop Ark. We thought such a thing was impossible. We were bonded to Lord Rawl, after all. You can't so simply break such a bond. Dark and Rawl sent Mord Sith to visit any number of lands in his far-flung empire. On one such mission, Alice had come here to the Citadel. That was when she first met Hannes Ark. Several of the Mord Sith with her died during the journey. Dark and Rawl shrugged when she returned and reported losing several of her sister Mord Sith. He said it was a dangerous place and it was to be expected. He considered the Mord Sith to be an expendable asset. He had plenty of Mord Sith and more than enough of any other woman he might want. Alice told us that it was then that she decided that if she ever had the chance, she would break her bond to the man. Then one spring, he again sent some of us off to check up on the petty ruler here, Bishop Ark. 
Since she had been here before, Alice led us on that mission. During the journey, she began to suggest that we could make it appear that our lives had been lost on the long mission to a far-off and dangerous place. As he listened, Ludwig stroked his thumb and first finger along the stiff, upright collar to either side of his throat. What made her think that Hannes Ark could take all of you in? After all, you were still bonded to his ruler. I asked her that. I told her that leaving him is one thing, but we would still be linked to him through the power of that bond. He would know we were alive. Just leaving wasn't a solution. She said that in this case, it was. She said that on her first visit to Fajin province, she had learned of Hannes Ark's hatred for the House of Rawl. He told Alice that if she and any of her sisters ever wanted to leave Dark and Rawl, he would provide refuge, and with his power, he could break their bond, replacing it with a bond to him instead. She told us that this was finally her chance and she wanted us to join her, to stay and be free of Dark and Rawl. We accepted and never returned to the People's Palace. With our bond to Dark and Rawl broken, everyone there believed us dead. So, we had traded one master for another. Only much later did I come to discover that, knowing Bishop Ark wanted anything that belonged to the House of Rawl, it had actually been Alice who suggested the scheme to Hannes Ark in the first place. He wanted a number of Mord Sith as the price of going along with her scheme. She had cooked up the entire plan and delivered us to Hannes Ark. It also turned out that in return for delivering us to him, Alice was given mastery over us. The authority Hannes Ark gave Alice over us outside the bond, a separate link all of her own, was not only improper, but went entirely to her head. We are her sisters, not her subjects. Yet she relished her dominion over us merely for the sake of exerting her petty power to make herself feel important. We still had to serve him first and do his bidding, so Hannes Ark never cared. She exploits that link not to serve her master, but purely for herself, to feel superior to her peers. When several of us were sent to assist you at the Abbey, like Hannes Ark, she never knew that you had abilities of your own. The truth is, she sent me to work for you as punishment, to humiliate me by having me help you in what she and Hannes Ark often scoffed at as petty and unimportant work. Hearing that Alice judged his work to be petty, was giving him a whole new perspective on the woman. It wasn't until after you made your offer to me that I even knew of your actual abilities, Erica said. Since then, I haven't been back here to the Citadel. Alice isn't aware that I have taken your bond, and I am no longer her chattel. For those reasons and others, I do not consider Alice trustworthy. I believe that, given the chance, she would sell you as cheaply as she sold us. He glanced over at Erica's brooding look. Would you like me to eliminate her? Erica really was an achingly beautiful woman. One of his weaknesses. No doubt one of the reasons Alice enjoyed having the power to dominate her. Erica gave him a resolute, meaningful look. Lord Dreyer, things have changed completely since then. I am now bonded to you, not Hannes Ark, and therefore Alice has no power over me. I can now deal with Alice if you would like to have her in your service. I assure you, I can not only deal with her, I, in fact, would take great pleasure in it. But because I don't trust her, I don't know that having me deal with her is in your best interest. I am telling you what I know about her so that you will be better able to make your own decision. I consider that part of my service to you. He arched an eyebrow as he nodded. Indeed, it is. I don't trust the woman one little bit, but you have ways of making even those kind choose to follow you, Erica said. I only want to warn you so that should you choose to use her services, you are aware of her nature and don't turn your back on her. He nodded thoughtfully. Of course. He glanced her way again. What about the others? The others are like me. They too were traded cheaply to Hannes Ark. I trust them, but that's me. They will not be at all inclined to trust you. They are still moored Sith, and at this moment, they are still bonded to Hannes Ark. He is alive, so that bond is active. They would be only too glad to kill you if they even suspected that you are a threat to their master or his rule. 
Their job is to see that you, or someone like you, does not pilfer so much as a teacup from his citadel, much less attempt to pull off what you intend to do. When they hear that you want to rule his land, they will be more than trouble. He smiled over at her as he started across the room. The carpets muffled their boots on the way. Not to worry. Chapter 38 Across the room, led by a pair of soldiers with short spears, five moored Sith in red leather filed into the room. Another pair of soldiers came in behind them. It was purely for show to set the stage. Just one of the moored Sith could easily have killed all four soldiers. The soldiers took up positions at attention at the sides of the room, while the five moored Sith stood stiffly at the head of the room, up three steps on the platform between the twin staircases. As he approached, Ludwig didn't think that they looked all that pleased to be summoned by a mere abbot. By now, they surely would have already heard rumors of that abbot taking over the citadel. They might not be happy about being forced into servitude to Alice, but that didn't mean they wanted anything to do with him, or intended to allow him to remain a threat to their master for long. Ludwig knew that it would be only a matter of moments before they decided to take matters into their own hands. He thought at time they had their attitudes adjusted, and they were given a choice of how they would like things to go for them. I am Lord Dreyer, he said as soon as he came to a halt. None of the five showed any reaction other than a glare. They were waiting to see what that meant. More than that, though, these were Mord Sith, and they feared very little, death least of all. This would require a different set of choices. The brunette, Alice, stood second from his right. She looked like a coiled viper waiting to strike. Ludwig stepped directly to her. You have something to say, Mistress Alice? She ran her tongue around the inside of her cheek a moment as she stared back, appraising him the way the moored Sith appraised people just before they struck out and killed them. Hannes Ark told us nothing of such a change. She finally said, I can't imagine what delusions would make you believe that you can walk into his home when he is gone and proclaim yourself to be Lord Dreyer and the master of the house and expect to be taken seriously. The master of Fajin province, he corrected. Not merely the master of the house, but the master of all of Fajin province. She arched her eyebrow even higher. Lord Ark told us that he was going to bring down our common enemy, the House of Rawl. She gestured among the moored Sith with her in red leather. We fled the House of Rawl. Hannes Ark took us in. He is our master. As our master, he powers our Ajil and has our loyalty. Hannes Ark does not power Mistress Erica's Ajil. Her scowl deepened. What are you talking about? Of course he does. Ludwig looked over at Erica. Why don't you show one of them how well your Ajil works? He gestured in their general direction. You pick. Without delay, Erica gritted her teeth as she rammed her ajeel into the middle of the big, blonde, moored Sith on the far right, beside Alice. The woman gasped in shock as she doubled over, folding around Erica's ajeel. It hurt too much for her to be able to cry out or even to draw a breath. Erica withdrew her ajeel and let it drop from her fingers to dangle once again at the end of the fine gold chain on her right wrist. The blonde moored Sith, blue eyes wide, toppled on her side, curled into a ball on the floor, shivering in agony, still unable to draw breath, despite how hard she struggled. Ludwig held a hand out toward Erica in invitation. Feel free to return the favor. Any of you, feel free to give as good as Erica gave. Show her you are not weak, moored Sith to be pushed around, and that your master still powers your ajeel. Gladly, Alice said through gritted teeth. She spun her ajeel up into her fist. She froze before taking a step. With an astonished expression, she slowly looked down at the weapon in her fist. Ludwig leaned in, cocking his head. Problem? It's... it's dead, Alice said in a confused whisper. I feel nothing from it. That's impossible. The woman Erica had put down struggled back to her feet and managed to straighten. They all took their ajeel up into their fingers, rolling them around, holding them in a fist. All of them looked confused, 
and a great deal less confident than they had only moments before. Puzzling, isn't it? He asked the five women, standing in a row as he paced before them. Servants to the sides rushed on their way, making sure not to look over at the moored Sith and what was going on with the new master of the house. They were obviously trying to get out of the room as quickly as possible. Soldiers rushing through the halls on their way to deliver new orders also quickened to their step. Two guards to either side of the room stood at attention, keeping their eyes strictly ahead as if they were statues that saw nothing. Ludwig stepped forward and circled an arm around Alice's shoulders. Well, you see, the thing is, Alice, your Aegeal is powered by your bond to your master. You were once bonded to Dark and Rall, and that loyalty to him is what powered your Aegeal. We know that. Alice snapped her fire back. Hannes Ark is now our master. Through his profound ability, he freed us from our bond to Dark and Rall to become our master and the one to power our Aegeal. We are bonded to him. Ludwig, gripping her shoulders tightly with his encircling arm, gave her an intimate joggle. Isn't it pretty obvious what has happened? He gestured toward Erica and then leaned back in, looking at Alice's face from only inches away. Erica's Aegeal works quite well, as I think the woman next to you could attest. But none of yours do. What do you suppose could explain that? Alice moved her arms restlessly as she began to notice a cramping that made her feel uncomfortable. She lifted a hand and saw that her skin was wrinkled. Prominent blue veins and brown spots covered the back of her hand. She stared for a long moment, trying to understand how her smooth, clear skin had changed. She abruptly reached up and touched her hair. She pulled the single braid forward and saw her brunette hair now streaked with gray. Moment by moment, as the other moored Sith watched, her hair gradually turned ever more gray and brittle. Her skin continued to thin and wrinkle. Abruptly, one of her upper front teeth dropped from her open mouth and bounced across the carpet. The other four women stared. Two more teeth quickly followed. Alice reached into her mouth with trembling, arthritic, deformed fingers and took out several more teeth that had loosened and fallen out within her mouth. She scooped out the handful of teeth and stared at them. In mere moments, she looked to have aged at least an additional sixty years. You aren't looking well, Alice, Ludwig said with feigned concern, his arm still around her shoulders, not well at all. He looked up at Erica. I don't think she looks well. Do you? No, Lord Dreyer, I don't. Erica said in a calm voice, not well at all. I, I don't understand, Alice stammered. The confusion on her deeply wrinkled face showed that she was clearly telling the truth. She didn't understand. She touched her face, her sagging jowls, her blotchy wrist. She put a hand over her loose red leather, feeling her shrunken breasts. What's happening to me? Ludwig, still leaning in, his arm still around her shoulders, frowned with a look of concern as he peered up into her face. Well, do you know, Alice, what I have heard tell a Mord Sith fears above all else? Her panic-stricken, washed-out eyes suddenly turned up to him, dying old and toothless in bed. He nodded earnestly. That's right, Alice. Dying old and toothless in bed. He finally removed his arm from around her frail shoulders and gestured toward the hallway. Now, Alice... I want you to go off to bed. Without objection, looking confused and addled with advanced age, the stooped old woman in drooping red leather started shuffling off to do as instructed. Once she had shambled off down a hall, Ludwig resumed his place before the other four, clasping his hands behind his back. I'm afraid that Alice's worst fears have come to pass. She is shortly going to die, in bed, old and toothless. He shook his head sadly as he sighed. Such a shame. One of the others swallowed. Abbot, I mean, Lord Dreyer, what is going on? He smiled. Well, it would seem that you have just taken the first step. You recognize me as Lord Dreyer. Does that mean that you accept me as your master? He cocked his head with a questioning look. Fully and completely? The master for whom you would lay down your lives? The master who will now hold your bond and power your Aegeal? 
Ludwig did not for one moment underestimate the powers that Hannes Ark wielded. But he didn't think the man could do what Ludwig had just done. And apparently the Mord Sith didn't think so either. One by one, all four of them nodded. Good, he said, smiling, vigorously rubbing his hands together. Very good. Now, why don't you try those Ajil again? They did, flicking the weapons back up into their hands, and by the look of resolve coming back into their eyes, it was clear that their Ajil now worked again. The woman had been restored to Mord Sith. They were bonded to him. Each of you has given up your bond to your old master and taken up a new one. You have made wise choices at the right times. First, you gave up your bond to Dark and Roll, and instead willingly gave your loyalty and service to Hannes Ark. But Hannes Ark has proven himself unworthy of you, to say nothing of letting Alice rule you in a way unfitting to Mord Sith. They shared looks among themselves. Now, each of you has again taken a new master, but this time one worthy of your unwavering loyalty. You are now all bonded to me, Lord Dreyer, as is Erica. Like Dark and Roll, Hannes Ark is a fallen, unworthy past master. It is now my ability that powers your Ajil. We understand, Lord Dreyer, one of them said as her back stiffened and her shoulders squared up. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you. The others straightened and swore their service, their loyalty and their lives to him as well. Ludwig placed a hand on Erica's shoulder. Mistress Erica has been with me for quite a while. He offered them a smile. She will, of course, be your mistress. She is in charge of you, and you will do as she says. But that is merely a chain of command. She does not own you, as Alice did. You are, again, sisters of the Aegeal. Understand? All of them, standing up straighter, looking well-pleased, nodded without reservation. Now, he said, I know enough about Hannes Ark to be able to tell you that I have different requirements of my Mord Sith. First of all, you are to wear black leather to indicate that you are in service to me. Is that understood? Again, they all nodded. That service to me extends to the bedroom. They blinked at the unexpected command and how blunt he had been about it. But they were far from shocked. It had been one of the reasons they had left Dark and Rawl. Ludwig had heard about the way Dark and Rawl used women. Hannes Ark, on the other hand, didn't care about their bodies, just their service to him. Ludwig Dreyer cared about both. But unlike their link to Dark and Rawl, their link to Ludwig was forged with occult powers. They might have believed that it was in part a function of their belief in his mastery over them and their sworn loyalty, as was their previous bond, but it was not. This time it was a bond forged with powers that they could not break as long as they lived, as long as he lived. This time death was their only escape from their bond, no matter how badly they might come to wish they could leave their service to him, the way they had left their service to Dark and Roll. But he didn't have the same rather exotic cravings with which Dark and Roll had been obsessed in fact, he considered the things he had heard about what the man did to women in the bedroom to be repugnant. Hardly a wonder they had wanted to be free of him. Ludwig's Mord Sith would not be plagued by the same wish to leave him just because he took them to his bed. He had simple tastes and simply enjoyed being with women the way the Creator intended. Mostly. Any questions? Comments? No, Lord Dreyer. They all said as one. He turned to Erica. You pick for me. Pick which one will spend tonight with me. Erica pointed at the one she knew he would like best. The blonde she had used her ajeel on. You. The Mord Sith bowed her head. Yes, mistress. I'm yours tonight then, Lord Dreyer, and any night you would have me. Ludwig was pleased that, once again, given the choices that he had shaped for them, they had chosen wisely. Once again, his insistence on focusing on people had advanced his cause. It so happened that it had also gotten him a comfortable new home from where he would prepare to offer choices to Hannes Ark's chaos. He nodded. It's still early. First, show me Bishop Ark's study, the recording room where he used the prophecy I sent to him. 
Although Ludwig had sometimes personally brought some of his important prophecies to Hannes Ark, the ones he wanted to make sure the bishop saw, the man had always insisted on meeting with him in a small secondary office, or in the grand entrance hall, sitting in the chairs, sharing tea as they discussed the prophecy. While they sipped tea, Ludwig fed the bishop the prophecies he wanted the man to know. Hannes Ark had never let him see the recording room, though, the place where he did most of his work. Ludwig wanted to see it himself, and know why not. The woman that Erica had picked for him held her arm out to the side. This way, Lord Dreyer. Chapter 39 Up on the top floor, an old scribe named Mahler nervously fumbled with the keys with one hand while holding a lantern in his other. Ludwig knew the man. He was the one person Hannes Ark seemed to trust, at least as much as he trusted anyone. He was the only scribe allowed to handle the prophecies that Ludwig sent to the Citadel. As Ludwig Dreyer impatiently watched the man groping through all the keys on the ring, flipping them over one at a time with a thumb, looking for the right one, he gave consideration to simply using his ability to blow the heavy door off its hinges. With a sigh, he reminded himself that there was no need to rush or use his abilities for trivialities. That was one of the ways he had managed to remain hidden under Hannes Ark's nose for so long. He didn't use his power when he didn't absolutely need to. No one was going to come chase him away from Hannes Ark's office door. The whole place belonged to Ludwig now. So he continued to wait patiently. Mahler looked up. Sorry, Master Dreyer. Lord Dreyer. Yes, Mahler said absently, his head bobbing. Lord Dreyer. I meant to say. Erica lifted the lantern from the man's hand so that he could use both hands to search through his fat ring of keys. Glancing up from time to time, nervous, fearing to be too slow, he sighed with relief when he at last found the key he was looking for. He tried to poke the trembling key in the lock, but he missed several times. Erica finally took hold of the man's gnarled hand, steadied it, and fed the key into the lock. He looked up. Thank you, mistress. I've been opening this door nearly all my life. He hesitated. I've just never had to open it for anyone other than understandable, Ludwig said, peering down at the sparse gray hair that lay over the top of the hunched old scribe's bald head. But you are still opening it for your master. Mahler looked up and blinked. Yes, I suppose I am. The man smiled at the notion as he started turning the key in the lock, jiggling it in a way that he apparently knew the old lock needed in order to give up the secrets beyond. With the proper touch of the scribe's experienced hand, the bolt finally clanged the back, freeing the door. Mahler pushed the door in as he stood aside to admit the new master. Inside, the scribe took his lantern back from Erica as he plucked a long sliver from an iron holder on the wall near the door. He lit the sliver in the flame of his lantern, dropped the glass cover back down, and then rushed around the room, using the flaming sliver of fat wood to light candles and lamps. The recording room was far more expansive than Ludwig had expected, with a high, beamed ceiling but no windows. Even with all the candles and lanterns Mahler was lighting, it was rather dark and gloomy. Ludwig scanned the odd collection of various things standing on display. Those displays were all placed in an even grid pattern, almost resembling pieces placed on a chessboard. And yet the way the cabinets, cases, statues, and pedestals were mixed together randomly made no logical sense, except perhaps as a representation of chess pieces of a game in play. Ludwig found the confusing arrangement rather obnoxious. He realized then that if he wanted, he might have them lined up together in an orderly manner or placed against walls, he thought it would make more sense if he grouped like things together. As he walked through the room, he mentally began redecorating the place, placing specific things together and making it more convenient to find particular items. He didn't know how Hannes Ark had worked in such seeming chaos. He supposed that he had lived here his entire life and was used to it. And, of course, Hannes Ark was an advocate of chaos, so in an odd way, it did seem fitting. But it also told Ludwig something important about the way Hannes Ark thought. He was, in certain ways, brilliant, and in many ways, highly focused. 
while in other ways incredibly powerful, effective, and dangerous. Yet he wasn't necessarily logical. At times, he went about things on whim or became fixated on one thing to the exclusion of all else, such as his obsession with the House of Rawl. Ludwig saw that the glassed cabinets he walked past held an odd mixture of rarities such as bones from strange creatures, or small statues, mechanical devices, and even round tubes with carved symbols all over them. The symbols resembled those tattooed all over Hannah's Ark. They were called story tubes, and they had been written in the language of creation. Ludwig knew that items with those symbols were ancient and exceedingly rare. Lives had been traded for such rare treasures. There were a number of stuffed animals in various places around the room. Besides the more common creatures in common poses, deer standing in an oval display of grass, a family of beavers on a mound of sticks, and raptors, wings spread on bare branches, there was a large bear towering up on its hind legs, jaws spread wide, with its claws raised so that it looked perpetually ready to attack. The things that really drew Ludwig Dreyer's attention, though, were the dozens of pedestals evenly spaced in various places throughout the room, conforming to the grid pattern. Each pedestal held an open book. The books were all enormous, with heavy leather bindings that showed great age and wear all around the edges. They would have been hard to move because of their sheer size, but also because they looked quite frail. So they appeared to have permanent homes on their pedestals rather than on some of the bookshelves against the back wall. Tables near the book pedestals were piled with disorderly stacks of scrolls. Ludwig recognized many as scrolls he had sent to the Citadel, to Hannes Ark, to be recorded in the Books of Prophecy. Some of those scrolls still had unbroken seals as they sat waiting their turn to be opened and recorded. Ludwig found that irritating. He had gone to enormous trouble in both time and effort to collect each and every one of those prophecies, to say nothing of the people who had given their lives in that work. Mahler held out a hand of gnarled arthritic fingers. This is my work, Lord Dreyer. These are the books you asked about. He gently laid his hand on one of the open books with a kind of reverent affection. This is where I write down all the prophecy brought to the Citadel. Ludwig frowned. You mean the prophecy that I sent to the Citadel? The old scribe stroked the knuckle of his first finger back along his gaunt cheek. Well, yes, Lord Dreyer. Those and others. Ludwig's frown deepened. Others? What do you mean, others? I was Bishop Ark's abbot. I am the one who uncovered prophecies on his behalf and sent them here, to the bishop. Mahler dipped his head. Yes, but there were others. Others? What others? The old man shrugged his hunched shoulders, hands opened out to the sides. I am sorry, Lord Dreyer, but I was not privy to such things. He gestured to one of the tables piled high. Scrolls and books are brought in and I record what is in them here, in these books. And only you record prophecy? You recorded all of what is in these books? He again placed a deformed hand on one of the books on a pedestal. These books are my work, but they predate me, of course. They contain the work of many who came before me. All of it is recorded here. I have entered all the prophecy found in these books since Bishop Ark entrusted me with a task back when I was still young. I have worked at this my entire life. Ludwig realized that Hannes Ark was not the only one privy to prophecy. Ludwig was sure that in all those many years of working with the books, Mahler would have had to go through the books and read what had come before. This unassuming old man probably knew more prophecy than just about anyone else alive. That made the man useful. Or dangerous. Ludwig had a sudden thought. How do you know which book to write the prophecy in? Do you fill one book and then go on to the next? No. Each prophecy must go in its proper book. How in the world do you determine that? Mahler frowned at the expanse of pedestals throughout the room that held books. 
He seemed confused by the question. Well, Lord Dreyer, each prophecy must be recorded where it belongs. How do you know where a prophecy belongs? He asked patiently. Did the bishop tell you? No, no. That was my job. He gestured at the scrolls. As you can see, he did not open them beforehand. He would review them after I had entered them. He said that it was easier for him to read it all once it was in my hand. Some of the writing is sloppy or rushed or poorly done so they can sometimes be quite difficult to read. So he always waited until I recorded them. It is my job to figure out what they say and then write it down clearly for the bishop. But what makes you decide to enter any given prophecy in a particular book? The subject, of course, the scribe said with simple sincerity. I put them where they belong. That way, if the bishop wanted to review a particular subject, he could go directly to that book rather than spend time searching through everything. He gestured to a particular volume not far away. For example, all the prophecy in that volume is about the House of Rawl. Of course, it is often difficult to categorize prophecy because it is usually about more than one thing. So, I must use my discretion. I try to determine the thrust of the prophecy, what it pertains to, and then I put it in a proper book. That's complete lunacy, Ludwig said half to himself. Lord Dreyer? He frowned at the scribe. That means they would not be set down according to any chronology. There is nothing, no chronology, to link all of these subjects and events. Ludwig knew quite well that chronology was what mattered most. What did it matter what prophecy had to say about a particular event meant to happen thousands of years ago? Unless you wanted to know about that event. Say, the Great War and the fate of Emperor Sulichan. Mahler shrugged. I rarely have any way of determining chronology, Lord Dreyer, so we use the subject as the category. Ludwig realized instinctively that all of this work was virtually for nothing. There was no real way of determining what a prophecy was really about simply by reading the words. Prophecy was almost always occulted, the true meaning hidden. The words were largely only a trigger for one properly gifted. Often the words of the prophecy were meant to disguise the true meaning. All of this work, Mahler's entire lifetime of work, had in reality been for nothing. The categories would be meaningless unless gifted or occulted talents were used to see into the vision of the prophecy to determine the true, hidden subject and therefore where it actually belonged. Ludwig supposed that the bishop didn't really care that he was gradually wasting the scribe's entire life on meaningless work. It gave him a place to go look at prophecy as he wished, all written out in the same hand for easy reading. Hannes Ark would have likely completely ignored Mahler's categories. Before he went to the books of prophecy to inspect them, to see what prophecy Hannes Ark could have gotten from other sources, something on the large desk caught his attention. He decided that he could look at the books later. They probably contained nothing more than redundant prophecy, prophecy Ludwig already knew about because he was the one who had collected prophecy on the subject if it was important enough. The rest couldn't be as valuable as the ones Ludwig had discovered and sent to the Citadel, so they could wait. At the cluttered desk, he went to the ancient-looking scroll that had caught his attention. Unrolling it part way on the desk, he saw a complex tapestry of lines connecting constellations of elements that constituted the language of creation. Ludwig frowned as he leaned in, studying the writing on the scroll. This is a cerulean scroll, he whispered in astonishment as he straightened. He looked over at the old man, watching him. This is a cerulean scroll, he said again louder. The old scribe showed no reaction. If you say so, Lord Dreyer. I don't know of such things. I can't read it. I only record the regular prophecy. Hannes Ark was the only one to work with items like this. They were his specialty. His specialty? A very dangerous specialty. You mean to say there are more of these? Mahler licked his lips. I'm not sure. As I say, 
that was Hannes Ark's specialty. I believe that this is one of the few at most with these symbols, but he had other written oddities, Lord Dreyer, that might be similar. Show me. Ludwig followed the hunched man as he headed to a cabinet against the stone wall. On the way, Ludwig stopped abruptly. An icy chill ran through him. Spirits, he whispered. Lord Dreyer? Mahler asked, turning back. Ludwig looked up. Spirits have been in this room. I can feel the essence trail they left behind. Mahler looked a bit uneasy as he glanced around, as if he expected them to pop out of thin air. The four moored Sith back near the door watched, but had nothing to offer. Erica, standing nearby, looked around and then shrugged. What do you know of the spirits that have been in this room? Ludwig asked the old man. Spirits? Nothing, Lord Dreyer. He hesitated, then added a thought. I can tell you that there have been times when I have had the feeling that this room was haunted. I've been in here with the bishop before. One of the moored Sith back by the door said, and I have had that same feeling. The feeling that this room was haunted. That's because it has been haunted, Ludwig said. Mahler looked around again, as if fearing there might be invisible spirits about to alight on his shoulder. So it really is haunted then? Has been, I said. Not now. Before. Spirits have been to this room. Mahler blinked. If you say so, Lord Dreyer... I wouldn't know of such things. The bishop never spoke to me of spirits. Ludwig knew that Hannes Ark would not have spoken to his humble scribe about such matters as he discussed with beings from another realm. He nodded as he gestured for the old man to continue with what he had been going to show him. Mahler turned and opened a cabinet door to reveal a wall of cubby holes, nearly all of them holding scrolls. Ludwig withdrew one with an aged, darkened edge. He opened it carefully so as not to damage it. As he thought, it was another Cerulean scroll. He didn't recognize the azimuth angles. He was familiar with the language of creation, though, and he was disturbed to see that the scroll spoke of prophecy. Not prophecy as in revealing prophecy, but about prophecy itself almost as if it were a living thing. The scroll spoke of a time when prophecy itself might be ended. Chapter 40 Ludwig replaced the scroll and hurried over to one of the huge books lying open on a pedestal. A table nearby held some of the scrolls that he recognized as being ones he had sent to the citadel. Not all had been opened. I was working there last, Mahler said as he lifted a hand toward the book, entering the most recent prophecies. Ludwig set aside his thoughts about the death of prophecy spoken of in the ancient scroll and instead turned his attention to the book lying open before him. He saw a prophecy that he recognized. It was a prophecy he had recently sent to the bishop. He was satisfied, to a degree, that the prophecy had at least been entered in a book. He had begun to wonder if it had all been left to sit around, unopened. He began carefully lifting the large pages and turning them back, scanning the prophecies, going back to the older things written in the books. He saw prophecy he didn't recognize. Important prophecy. Growing more suspicious, Ludwig went to the nearest table with the scrolls. He set unopened ones of his own that he had sent to the bishop aside and pushed the ones he didn't recognize to the other side. Once the scrolls were separated, he selected one of the latter, and broke a seal he didn't recognize, opening the prophecy that had come from another source. As Ludwig read, his mood darkened. While he didn't recognize the scroll or the hand that had written it, he knew the prophecy all too well. It was a prophecy he had withheld from the bishop. It was one of the prophecies that Ludwig had uncovered himself and considered too important to send to Hannes Ark. He quickly broke a seal and opened another scroll, and again, it was an important prophecy that Ludwig had withheld from the bishop. Quickly opening several more of the scrolls only added to his alarm. One was a trivial prophecy he had submitted to the bishop, but the rest of the prophecies were ones he had extracted himself and deliberately kept from the bishop's eyes. Someone else, though, had been providing the bishop with those divinations that Ludwig and Erica had discovered by taking people to the cusp of death. 
Such foretelling had been great effort to retrieve. He couldn't imagine how anyone else had managed to discover the same prophecy. While Ludwig had kept to himself what he had discovered, someone else had turned them over to Hannes Ark. He knew it couldn't possibly be Erika. What he was reading was beyond her ability to reproduce. Mord Sith didn't understand complex magic such as prophecy, and it was far too detailed for her to remember. Such writings took his occult talents to transcribe. Besides, she was with him almost all the time. She was his bodyguard, as well as his assistant. In those brief times when she wasn't at his side, she would never have had the time to write out even this one scroll, much less all the others. More than that, there was no way she could have gotten the scrolls out of the abbey and to the citadel. Ludwig had known every coming and going to the abbey. His occult abilities would have alerted him had anyone been sneaking anything out. No, it had not been Erica. But if not her, then who? No one else at the abbey could have produced these scrolls. No one else had been present to hear the prophecies. No one could transcribe what they had not been there to hear. He would have known if anyone had been using gifted talent to hear the prophecy given by the ones on the cusp of death. These scrolls containing such important prophecy had come from somewhere else. Hannes Ark had someone else also providing him with prophecy. But who? And, more importantly, how? Ludwig gritted his teeth in anger. He went to other books on pedestals and scanned a few of the pages. There were prophecies in them that should not be there. Prophecies he had not wanted Hannes Ark to see. Prophecies that Ludwig had discovered and withheld. He cast a dark look at the old scribe as he pointed to the table of scrolls he had examined. Where did these come from? Who sent them? Mahler's face paled at the look Ludwig was giving him. I'm sorry, Lord Dreyer. But I don't know. Sometimes soldiers brought in a scroll for the bishop. Sometimes, when I arrived in the morning, the bishop was already here, and he told me that there were more prophecies that had arrived in the night for me to record. He never said where they had come from, and I knew better than to question the man. I knew the scrolls that had come from the abbey because I recognized the messenger who brought them. And sometimes you brought them yourself. Even if I had not been around to see them arrive, I recognize the scrolls written in your hand. But I don't know about the others. I can tell you that they are written by at least half a dozen different people and apparently arrived from different places. From different places? More than one place? Are you sure? Mahler shrugged nervously. I don't know for sure, Lord Dreyer. It could be that they all came from the same place, but were written out by different people. Being in different hands, I assumed they were from different places. That made the most sense, he supposed. Ludwig always worked alone, but that was because he'd had ulterior motives in the prophecy he collected. Other places wouldn't have had that need to work alone, and might have employed a staff, all collecting prophecy from the same source. Ludwig paced as he considered. This was not good news. Not good news at all. It was going to take a lot of work to catalog all of the prophecies to see which ones Ludwig had withheld that had somehow been provided to Hannes Ark anyway. He needed to know how much Hannes Ark knew. He didn't like surprises. He needed to know what he wasn't aware of. Prophecy was a blade that the man used to cut down opposition. Ludwig needed to know how sharp was the edge on that blade. As he paced, his attention was caught by something in a cabinet. There, on a glass shelf, was a knife. The knife was speared through a withered hand, but not just any hand. It was the hand of a spirit, with a faint glow about it, caught and frozen in corporeal form. The door of the case squeaked as he opened it and took out the knife. He held it up, showing Erica the skewered, mostly transparent hand. I don't know for sure what that is, she said, but I think you have found some pretty convincing evidence of ghosts having been in this room. More importantly, he said with a smile, I have also found a knife that interacts with them. He pushed the hand off the blade, and once free it vanished in a twisting wisp of vapor. The blade had apparently trapped it in the world of life. 
Satisfied that the knife was what he thought it was, he slipped it under his belt until he could look around to see if he could find the sheath for it. The knife was far too valuable to leave lying around. He wondered what other things of such profound value he would find in the room. He wondered, too, what items Hannes Ark might have taken with him. Ludwig let his gaze roam across the books of prophecy lying open all throughout the room. Prophecy that he had not wanted Hannes Ark to see. But despite his efforts, the man had seen it. Ludwig sighed. Is it going to be a problem? Erica asked, seeing his worried look at the prophecy. The die has already been cast, he said, looking into her steely blue eyes. The events have already been set into motion. There is no calling them back now. Hannes Ark has a demon by its tail. It is no less perilous a problem for the Spirit King. They need each other. I need neither of them. Chaos has now been loosed on the world. But I will rein it in. Just then, he felt something getting off the slightest tingle at his waist. He reached inside his coat and ran a thumb under his belt until he found the hidden pocket. Slipping his finger into the pocket, he scooped out his journey book. He flipped open the black leather cover and turned over the first page. He always erased the previous messages as a precaution. There, he saw new writing. My, my, my. Now isn't this interesting? What is it? Erica asked. It would seem... He murmured to her as he read the message again to himself. That things are suddenly looking up. Chapter 41 Richard heard someone screaming at him. They were screaming at him to breathe. When he tried, he realized that he couldn't draw breath. He tried again, pulling harder, but it wouldn't come. His lungs burned and it felt like he had the weight of a mountain pressing down on top of his chest. He felt a hard shock, like a jolt of lightning slamming into him. The woman screamed again, louder, breathe. He sat bolt upright and gasped. His eyes popped open. He sucked in another desperate breath, as if he had been sinking under dark black waters and unable to breathe, and now he had finally gotten his head back up above the water. He had seen them there, waiting in the blackness, dark wings opening in anticipation of having him. Nikki was kneeling on the ground to his left, Zed to the right. They both had flinched back at how fast he'd sat up. They pressed their fingers back to his temples. It had been Niki he'd heard screaming at him to breathe. And he now recognized that it had been Zed's gift crackling through him like lightning. Niki closed her eyes as she bowed her head and put trembling fingers of her other hand to her forehead. Dear spirits, thank you, she whispered to herself. Richard panted, still confused, still trying to get enough air, still trying to make sense of where he was and what was happening. It felt so good having air fill his burning lungs that he simply wanted to feel himself breathe. It was such a relief not to see the dark ones coming for him. As his dazed, murky awareness cleared, he could begin to sense the air of desperation around him. Irina leaned in with joyful surprise. In her exuberance, she knocked Niki's and Zed's hands off him in order to grip his shoulders. Richard, she gave him a gleeful shake. You're back. You're at last awake. Richard blinked as he looked around, finally starting to catch his breath. Then he saw her. Colin, beaming with a big smile, crowded Irina aside as she leaned in to put her arms around him in a tight hug, almost squeezing all the air back out of his lungs. She finally leaned back only because she needed to gaze into his eyes. Her green eyes, even though they brimmed with tears, had never looked more beautiful to him. Welcome back, she whispered to him in relief. She bent forward then and kissed him. It took his breath, but this time in a good way. In that instant, it seemed that all the wonderful moments of being with her flashed across his mind's eyes. Everything from the first time he had looked into her eyes in the Heartland Woods to the day they were married, to seeing her again, now. The world was still spinning as all the sights and sounds rushed in around him, but Colin's soft lips on his made it all come gracefully to a halt. Everything at last settled and seemed right again. 
As Colin finally backed away to let him catch his breath, he saw men of the first file at a respectful distance back beyond the immediate group, all with serious, concerned expressions. Their postures eased in relief. Towering pines sheltered them under a late-afternoon leaden sky that threatened drizzle. The light there in the woods, under those low clouds and with the trees all around, was muted and mellow. Richard spotted a squirrel running across a limb and heard birds singing and chirping. Leaves of a leaning birch tree shimmered in a breath of breeze. He found the sight of the woods all around them, the life all around them, cozy and comforting. It was like being home. It felt safe. In a way, he was home, back home to the world of life. It felt as if he had been in a dark place for a hundred years, unsure if he would ever find his way back. Seeing Colin made him forget even the pain and made the vision of the Dark Ones recede. He saw a tear run down Niki's cheek. Zed, too, looked shaken. We made it then, Richard said. More a statement to himself than a question, and also meant to reassure them that he was indeed back and all right. We made it up through the gorge. It worked. Samantha stuffed her head of frizzy black hair under Zed's arm to worm her skinny body in closer in order to hug her thin arms around Richard's chest. Lord Rawl, you're all right. We were so worried. I wasn't, Zed said to the girl who had snuck in under his arm. Nothing to be worried about. He paused to swallow. Just a matter of applying the proper skills to the task at hand. Richard glanced over at Niki. She rolled her wet blue eyes. He knew then that it had not been at all easy. Although everyone in the camp looked relatively calm, except with regard to his wellness, he was worried that they might still be in danger from the Shuntuk. Where are we? Did you manage to kill all the Shuntuk that were after us? Were there any survivors? Did we get away from them? Are all of our men safe? Did we take any casualties? Unfortunately, we lost a few of the men, but the rest of us are safe now. Colin assured him. We made it up out of the gorge. And then the men built a bridge so we could cross a deep chasm. A chasm? A deep one. And it's a long, long way around. Commander Fister said from back behind Samantha and her mother. On the off chance any survived, they will be a long time going around it to get to us. They can track us, Richard reminded them. With the bridge now at the bottom of that chasm, Colin said, we think we're pretty safe for now. Sulachan could have sent others, he reminded them. Maybe even worse. It's not only the ones he sends that we need to worry about. Now that the barrier to the Third Kingdom has been breached, all the various tribes and nations of half-people are now free to come out and hunt for those with souls. They migrate like swarms of locusts. Any of them could show up anywhere, anytime. We had to stop so Niki and Zed could revive you, Colin said in their defense. We had no choice. They didn't think they'd dared to wait any longer. Niki and Zed looked grim. As if to say, Colin wasn't telling him the half of it. Irina leaned to the side so she could see him around Colin. I helped, too. Thank you, Richard said to her. He saw the look Niki gave the woman, but Irina was smiling at him so she didn't notice. If she had, she might have kept her mouth shut. He was suddenly aware of how little any of them were actually saying about the battle with the Shuntuk, or what had become of them. The plan worked, then? He asked. We're safe for now. Colin assured him when she saw him looking from one person to the next, not quite believing it had been all that easy. His gaze finally settled on Colin. No one else existed in that moment. Did you have to use the sword? The question visibly rattled her. Looking into the depths of Colin's bewitching green eyes for a long moment, watching the specter of that experience ghost across her face, he knew that she had. He knew what it was like. He knew all about it. It's different, he said softly to her, than killing those with a soul. Colin gave him a knowing nod. Now she knew as well. I don't know how you are even able to think with that sword in your hand, she said to him. Different? Zed interrupted, lifting a hand, leaning in a little, looking back and forth between the two of them. What do you two mean, different? When you use the sword to take a life, Richard said, the sword exacts a price for doing your bidding. It brings pain of taking a life. Righteous anger is your shield against the pain. 
Using the sword to kill separates a soul from its worldly anchor of its body, and thus life from death. But half people have no soul, so the sword is freed from any responsibility of guilt in breaking the grace, so its rage is unbounded, and in turn it gives you no pain for your rampage. Guilt? he asked. What do you mean? Richard thought for a moment how to explain such an experience. Well, there is a kind of pressure, a resistance pushing back at your determination to kill. The soul of that person is struggling to remain here in this world, and their will to live is resisting crossing the boundaries between life and death. At the same time, in the back of your mind, there is always a comprehension of the full meaning of life as something sacred. Although necessarily committed to killing in order to preserve the lives of innocent people, that awareness of the soul you are sending to the underworld and your own innate reverence for life gives you a counter-pressure to the need to do it. Because it was created by one with a soul, that same innate, inward resistance was inescapably forged into the blade. But when you kill half-people without a soul, and although it is still killing and they may look human, they aren't really human. So there is no resistance to the sword's fury, or yours. You are not sending a soul to the underworld. Battling half-people is like being plunged in a world of madness, where you feel boundless ecstasy at the bloodshed the magic can bring to them. Both you and the sword are free to kill without that innate resistance. You wade into the slaughter with a kind of immunity to guilt. As a result, your anger, the sword's anger, are liberated on a whole new level. It's as frightening as it is glorious. He was still gazing into Colin's eyes. You used the sword in that way. So you know what I mean. When she slowly nodded, he knew what she had been through. Commander Fister, Niki said into the sudden silence, would you please take Irina and Samantha back to get them some of that stew you have had cooking? They have both been standing by for quite a while in case they were needed. Now that Richard is awake, they finally have a chance to get a bite to eat. They should do it now in case we need them later. By her tone of voice, Commander Fister understood that it was a command she expected to be carried out. He put a big hand under Irina's arm and lifted the woman back with him. Come on, ladies. Let me get you some of the boar stew, he said, cheerfully eager for her to try it. I helped make it myself. We added rabbit, spices, mushrooms we collected from stumps, marsh, spinach, and some fat snails from along the stream. I'd really like a woman's opinion of how I did. Well, I... I would really rather... Irina stammered, looking back toward Richard, hoping for him to intervene. He only smiled his assurance that the commander was right and she should eat. It has to be done by now, Commander Fister said as he dragged her along with him. Before we serve it to anyone else, I would be honored if you would be the first to taste it and tell me what you think. Samantha, come along and taste it with your mother. Samantha stood, torn between staying close to Richard and going with her mother. After a moment's hesitation, she ran to catch up with her mother. I guess that I could give it a taste, Irina said, looking back over her shoulder as she was being hauled away. Her face brightened then. I'll give it a taste to make sure it's finished, and then bring Richard a bowl. He needs to eat more than any of us. Good idea, Commander Fister said. Let's go have a bowl and see what you think first. Chapter 42 As soon as the two women were dragged far enough away, Niki, looking particularly displeased, leaned toward Richard, her blue eyes ablaze. Some of her long blonde hair fell forward over her shoulder as she peered intently at him. What did you teach that girl about using magic? He could see Colin's small smile as she sat back out of the way, not wanting to get in the middle of it. What are you talking about? Niki gritted her teeth. That girl has a temper, a very bad temper. And you don't? Richard asked. Not like hers. Richard frowned suspiciously as he looked at Zed's guarded expression and then back at Niki. Why? What did she do? That's what I want to know. I asked her where she learned such things. Niki jabbed a finger into his shoulder, and she said that you taught her. Richard tipped his head back as he realized what she had to be talking about. Ah, that. Yes, that. 
Nikki growled as she punctuated each word with another poke of her finger. What did you teach her? Mr. I don't know how to use my gift. Actually, Richard said, I only taught her what you taught me. Her frown faltered. What are you talking about? Remember when you explained to me how you made trees explode? Nikki's gaze wandered as she tried to recall what she might have said. All I ever told you was that by using my gift, I concentrated heat inside one spot in a tree trunk so that the heat rapidly turned the sap to steam, and with nowhere to go, it expanded and blew the tree apart. That's it. That's the explanation I gave her. Richard tilted his head in toward her. But let me tell you, Samantha is really good at it. Really good. What I told you about how I exploded tree trunk was a superficial explanation. Nikki fixed him with a cynical scowl. I never gave you any of the important details about how to do such a thing because I was never able to teach you about your gift. That means you have no knowledge of underlying principles or causative factors that you could pass along to her. So, you are trying to tell me that you simply gave her that superficial explanation and she was able to do it? Like telling her to flap her arms and she could fly like a bird? Well, he admitted, it wasn't exactly that simple. Really? she mocked. Then how did she manage to do such powerful conjuring from what you told her? Sometimes, in a desperate situation, people can instinctively apply their knowledge to a new problem. We were being chased by a lot of desperate half-people. They were like swarms of locusts coming at us. It seemed like there were thousands of them. I didn't stop to count, but I probably cut down hundreds, and it made little difference. They just kept coming. There were far too many for me to fight off with the sword. Samantha tried everything she knew, but regular magic doesn't work very well on half-people. I knew we were in a lot of trouble and needed something more, or we were going to die. So, since half-people are still harmed by things like swords or even hitting them with a rock, I told her about making trees explode. I told her that she needed to focus her power inside tree trunks to make them explode to try to help stop the half-people who were after us. She was afraid. She had never done anything like that before. But she couldn't do it. So at that point, all we could do was run. Then they managed to get around us and trap us. There were so many half-people, we couldn't fight them off, and we were trapped. We both thought we were going to die. I pushed her into a crevice in the rock, and then I squeezed in after her. In that moment, hiding down in that dark, narrow crack in the rock, just before they pulled us out and we were eaten, she said that she thought about everything that they were taking away from us all the friends and loved ones these half-people were going to kill. How they killed her father, and how they would kill her mother. And she got so angry thinking about it that her ability suddenly broke through that mental block and she started blowing the trees apart in order to stop them. But it was nothing like I ever saw the gifted do in the war. It's hard to describe. I mean, this was on a scale you can't imagine. Oh, I think I can, Nikki said with an even look. She blew the forest apart, Richard said. I don't mean she blew some of the trees apart, or even a bunch of trees. I mean she completely leveled everything in sight all around us. Everything. The storm of shattered splinters blasting out in every direction shredded every last one of the half-people. Thousands of them. Nothing was left standing other than a few splintered stumps. Thousands, Zed repeated. Richard nodded to his grandfather. That's right. I've never seen anything like it. So that's what I taught her, that she had to superheat the sap in a tree to make it blow apart. Nikki looked skeptical. And that's all you told her? His mouth twisted as he remembered the rest of it. I guess that I also told her that getting angry was how I was able to power my gift. I told her that focusing that anger was both an effective way to fight and to use magic. He looked around at the three faces watching him. Why? What did she do this time? She stood there all by herself, Colin said, and brought the cliff walls to the sides of the gorge down on the shuntuck. They were trapped in the bottom of the narrow pass. For a time, it looked like the whole mountain was coming down. Really? Richard looked around at the grim faces. You mean she actually brought the cliffs down? But the soldiers were going to handle it. He frowned at Colin. What happened? Colin sighed. Zed and Nikki used magic to eliminate all the ones they could. They killed a great many. But there were many more 
that were not touched by regular magic. The soldiers needed to take care of the rest of them. That battle was going well, and despite their numbers, your plan was working. It was ruthlessly effective, as a matter of fact. We had them trapped, and we were cutting them down. But then some of the Shuntuk with occult powers appeared and started to melt our men. Richard leaned forward. Melt them? What do you mean, melt them? Colin lifted a hand in an uncomfortable gesture at the memory. It was horrifying. The Shuntuk used some kind of occult sorcery. In an instant, the flesh on the men standing to either side of me seemed to boil as it melted right off them. At the same time, their bones came apart. They were killed in a heartbeat. I knew that there was no way we could stop such half-people. We had no defense against such occult sorcery. The sword could stop them, Richard said. I know, Colin said. I killed that one before he could kill any more of us, but I didn't know how many more there were like him. One more? A hundred? A thousand? Later, the sergeant sent to close off the rear reported the same thing. The Shantuck didn't care how many casualties they were taking. Once they had that bloodlust driving them, they kept coming no matter what, and those with that occult power were going to kill all our men to get at you and me. I had to make a split-second decision before we lost everything. I did the only thing I could do. I ordered a retreat. I turned the men back, and we ran for our lives. The Shuntuk were coming after us. We knew that we stood no chance against those Shuntuk sorcerers. So what happened? Richard asked. Your little student happened, Niki said. She stood there all by herself in the middle of the gorge with her eyes closed and blew the towering cliffs to either side of the defile completely apart. It looked like the end of the world. It seemed like the entire mountain caved in on the Shuntuk. It buried the lot of them. Niki leaned back. Now I know how she did it. Zed's bushy brow drew down. You think she did with rock what you do with trees? She used what Richard taught her, Nikki told him. She basically did the same thing as blowing apart a tree. The principle is the same. She concentrated heat into the water seeping through all the cracks in the rock. As wet as it is, the rock is soaked through. With nowhere for the superheated water to escape, much like in the trunk of a tree, the force of it, as it was turned to steam, blew the rock apart. Actually, since rock is so much harder than wood, it creates a more powerful explosion. Can you do such a thing? Colin asked. Nikki looked at her a long moment. Maybe, on a small scale. But I couldn't do what she did. I know that much. I can't even imagine how much ability that girl has. She said that her mother taught her how to heat a rock to keep warm at night. Richard said she must have used the same technique, but on a larger scale. She's quite talented. Nikki shot him an angry glare. She has a dangerous temper, he shrugged. Sure, if you're one of the half people, her temper is pretty dangerous. But she would never hurt us. She only wants to help. That kind of temper, that temper saved all of our lives, Richard said. She also saved my life along with hers that day in the woods. She also helped me get into the Third Kingdom, find all of you, and then I was able to get all of you out of there. If not for that temper of hers, we'd all be dead. I suppose. Niki folded her arms. We don't know nearly enough about her, though. Or about her mother. We haven't been together long enough for you to tell me much about what you learned or what happened in the Third Kingdom. And we've been almost continually on the run, so I haven't been able to ask any questions of Irina. I want to know what Samantha and her mother are capable of. What kind of abilities they have. As far as I know, Richard said, they're sorceresses. There are sorceresses... And then there are sorceresses. Richard nodded. I guess I have a few questions of my own. There is still a lot about their village of Stroiza, and their purpose there that I'd like to know about, Zed put in. I would like to have some of the gaps filled in and get some details about them and the people where they live. Richard, I brought you some stew, Irina called out as she rushed toward them, holding it out in both hands. Now's your chance, Richard said. Chapter 43 You need to eat, Irina said as she leaned in with a tin bowl filled to the brim with stew. It's good. Lots of wild boar meat. It will help you get your strength back. She lifted it out toward him again. Go on, eat. Richard thanked her as he took the bowl. He was starving. He held out a hand. Sit with us, Irina. We'd like to know more about you and your home of Stroiza. 
We wonder what you can tell us about the North Wall, as your village called it. Her face, an older version of Samantha's, brightened at the invitation. As she was sitting, soldiers brought bowls of stew for everyone else. Colin smiled up at the soldier who handed her a bowl. Niki took one but set it down on the ground beside her. Zed started eating as soon as he had a bowl in his hands. Richard was famished, so he had to take a bite first. Mmm. Commander Fister, you make a great stew. He smiled, happy that the Lord Rawl liked it. That's what I told him, Irina said. I told him you would like it. Now that the soldiers had brought over more, she and Samantha each had a bowl as well. Their likeness was uncanny. Sitting there beside each other on a small blanket, both skinny, both with the same thick thatch of frizzy black hair, dark eyes, and narrow faces, they looked like an older and younger version of the same person. The immature femininity of Samantha's smooth features gave her a sweet look. Those same features had hardened on Irina's face into a calculating countenance. Richard could see that behind Irina's smile and dark eyes was a woman who had led a hard life. Where Samantha still possessed the treasure of youthful optimism, Irina had traded that optimism for pragmatism, and it looked like it had been an eager trade. After swallowing another bite, Richard gestured with his spoon toward Irina. Tell me about Stroiza. I'd like to hear what you know about the Third Kingdom and the evil hidden behind that barrier. Tell me what you know of it. Irina shrugged. We were given an ancient duty, passed down from one generation to the next, to watch over that barrier. Samantha told me that she showed you the viewing port, where we watched the North Wall, as we called it. Our duty was to check that the gates still held. When she fell silent and went back to eating stew, Richard asked something more specific. Have there always been gifted living at Stroiza? Yes, she said after swallowing a mouthful. My husband had an older sister, Clarice. She was the sorceress who led the rest of us gifted in Stroiza, and the rest of the village, for that matter. She had been the matriarch for, my, I can't even remember how many years, since well before Samantha was born. She was a hard woman, with an iron will, but fair. And I take it she passed away? Zed asked. Yes, a little over a year and a half ago. The men who found her dead in the woods said that she was just sitting there, leaned up against a tree, looking like she had taken a nap, and in the middle of it, never woke back up. Then my mother took her place, Samantha said with obvious pride. So there were no other gifted in Stroiza? Zed asked. Yes, I have had two sisters, both gifted, as were their husbands, although to a lesser extent. I never actually took Clarice's place, though. Stroiza is a small village. It wasn't like it needed a queen to rule over it. So this Clarice thought of herself as the queen of the people of Stroiza? Zed asked. Irina shrugged one shoulder. At times. After her death, the six of us discussed matters when there was need. We didn't include Samantha in those discussions because she is still too young. She thought better of it and smiled over at her daughter. Well, she was too young. No longer, it seems. She is growing into a fine sorceress. Zed reached out, patted Samantha's knee, and gave her a wink. Yes, she is. Samantha beamed. So the six of you discussed things, like when you started hearing rumors about the hedge maid? Richard asked, having heard all this before, when Samantha had originally told him. He wanted to hear Irina's version, though. That's right. Millicent's husband felt he had a gift of prophecy, and he had long warned of wicked forces loose in the dark lands. He considered the rumors to be proof of his ability, but I thought otherwise. What do you mean, you thought otherwise? Zed asked, looking up from shoveling stew into his mouth. Irina again shrugged the one shoulder. The Dark Lands are a vast and dangerous place. In such a place, there are always dark forces at work, always evil about. To state the obvious, that they will cause trouble, hardly seems prophecy to me. And you believe that's because the evil behind the barrier has long been leaking out? Richard said. She blinked at him. That's right. How did you know that? It has been my experience he said, glancing at his grandfather out of the corner of his eye, that barriers holding back evil 
do not fail all at once. Over time, they begin to degrade so that small bits of what is beyond can begin to slip through that barrier. It tends to go unnoticed because the barrier still stands and people have long since forgotten what to look for. They get complacent. As time passes, what slips through grows stronger until there are precursor events. Samantha waggled a finger at him. I bet you're right. I never thought of that. But I bet that's the reason for some in the Darklands to have strange powers. Like the cunning folk? Richard asked before taking a spoonful of stew. That's right, Irina said, giving him a funny look as if wondering what else he might already know. The occult powers locked away behind the barrier thousands of years ago were incredibly powerful. After all, some of those half-people have occult powers that can bring the dead back to life again. Well, make them move about, anyway, Richard said. Those powers can animate them, and so they can be sent to attack people, but I don't think they are actually alive. We read that in the writing on the walls in the tunnels back in Stroiza, Samantha told her mother, the tunnel outside the viewing port. Irina frowned at her daughter. What in the world are you talking about? What writing? What do you mean you read about it in the writing on the walls? All those designs carved into the walls are writing. Writing? She stared in surprise. Are you sure? Samantha nodded that it was so. The language of creation. Irina gave her daughter an admonishing look. You mean that Richard read the writing? Well, yes. It was Lord Rawl who told me it was writing and what it said. Zed was frowning at Richard again. What was this writing? Who put it there? Richard gestured with a spoonful of stew. It was in the language of creation, like we found at the People's Palace. He didn't want to mention out loud about the ancient omen machine associated with the writing they had found back at the People's Palace. He wanted to know things, not reveal them. Zed caught his drift and nodded with an, ah. So, do you know who put it there, or when? Irina asked. It was put there by a sorceress named Naja Moon, Richard said. She intended it to explain to the people of Stroiza and all the rest of us the evil that Emperor Sulichan had created in the Great War. Her people had not been able to extinguish that evil, but they were able to build a barrier with magic to seal it off and contain it. They warned that it wouldn't hold forever. So the people of Stroiza were to keep watch. It said that was all they could do until the right person came along to put an end to the threat of what was behind those walls. Zed was frowning again. Richard realized he had already said too much. Did this sorceress from back so long ago say if they knew who would be able to put an end to this evil? Zed asked. When Richard hesitated in answering, Samantha spoke up, eager to tell the story. She drifted her spoon before them, as if pulling back the curtain of time, and then leaned in with the secret scent across time itself. Naja Moon said that only the bringer of death could do it, and even then, only by ending prophecy. Zed almost dropped his bowl of stew. The bringer of... So you were saying? Richard interrupted, rolling his spoon toward Irina to get her to go on, about the evil behind the barrier leaking out. Richard ignored his grandfather, turning the conversation back to what he really wanted to know, not what he already knew. Irina's attention was again riveted on Richard. Yes... That's right. My sisters and I always suspected that a little bit of that occult power has been seeping out through the barrier for, for, well, the Creator only knows how long. But I think it explains a lot of things about the Darklands. That certainly makes a lot of sense, Zed said as he thought it over. He seemed to have gotten the message that this was not the time or place to discuss the bringer of death. Zed knew all too well that the bringer of death referred to Richard. Power like that is not easy to contain, he explained. While that barrier may have held for thousands of years, it would have begun to deteriorate long before it finally suffered a total catastrophic failure. That's the way such things work. My suspicion as well, Irina said. When we started hearing rumors about this hedge maid, Jit, as the country people called her, and the strange healing powers she was said to have, my sisters and I began to suspect that power leaking out through the barrier had something to do with it. We thought that it might even foretell that the barrier was getting close to failing. So in the fall, when the water level was at its lowest, Martha and her gifted husband went into Karga Trace to look into the rumors about the hedge maid. 
Martha was experienced and powerfully gifted, so she thought it best if she were the one to go investigate. We never heard from them again. Half the village searched for them for weeks. We didn't know where in Cargat Trace to look for this hedge maid. And besides how vast it is, that foul swamp is dangerous. We feared more of our people might be hurt or killed, so we had to give up the search. Eventually, the spring rains came and the swamp overflowed, washing out remains in the overflow. The remains belonged to my sister and her husband. Nikki looked up from her bowl of stew. What kind of remains? She asked, obviously incredulous that much of anything could be left after all that time in a swamp. Bones. Irina tapped her thigh with her spoon. Just some of the larger, heavier bones, like these. Nikki frowned. If Karga Trace is so dangerous, and people went into the place to see the hedge maid for her healing powers, then a lot of people may have died in that swamp. The bones could have belonged to anyone. How did the people in your village know that they were your sister's bones? Irina rested her hand with a spoon on her knee, looking off into the distant memories for a moment. I'm the one who identified my sister's bones. They carried the telltale trace of the gift. I recognized those traces of the gift as belonging to my sister Martha. I see, Nikki said as she put her head down over her bowl and went back to eating her stew. Then, not long after that, soldiers came and took my other sister Millicent and her husband Giles away to the abbey. I suspect that it was probably because Giles was always boasting to people that he had the gift for prophecy. The abbey was where Abbot Dreyer collected prophecy for Hannah's Ark. The soldiers said that prophecy belonged to all the people. Irina stirred her stew as she stared down into it. They never returned. I know all about Ludwig Dreyer, Colin said, her expression darkening. I have sworn that I will kill him. By the condition Colin had been in when Richard had shown up, just before Dreyer and his moored Sith, Erica, had started torturing her in earnest, he knew that Colin was bound and determined to keep that vow. If Richard didn't get to Dreyer first. Anyway, Irina said, when I saw that the gates in the north wall were open, that the barrier had been breached, my husband and I left at once to inform the wizard's council at the keep. Zed looked up from his bowl to share a look with Richard. There is no longer a wizard's council at the keep. Zed told Irina. Her expression had turned grim. I know that now. But at the time, I didn't. We didn't make it far before the half-people captured us. She swallowed back the anguish. Well, they captured me. They... I'm terribly sorry about your husband, Richard said. And your father, Samantha. Samantha, looking dispirited, nodded her thanks. Lord Rawl says that in High Daharn, Stroiza means sentinel. Samantha told her mother. I guess that makes perfect sense. We were there to warn people if the north wall was ever breached. And you never knew the meaning of all that writing in the passageway? Richard asked. That writing was left there to tell your people the whole story, to explain everything. Irina looked up into his eyes. Richard, what difference does it make now? All of that past history? The barrier is breached. We can't afford to bother with history supposition and speculation right now. What matters now is healing you. We have to get that taint of death out of you, or you will die. And Colin, Richard said. Irina glanced over at Colin. Yes, of course. And Colin. Chapter 44 Believe me, Richard said, I know how badly we need to be rid of this deadly poison, but in the meantime, there are still... I don't think you do. Irina was finished with being patient. Her expression turned serious in the way sorceresses had of turning serious. That poison is deadly. We need to get it out of you. That is what matters above all else. Everything else can wait. We know that, Richard said, and we will be able to take care of it just as soon as we get back to the People's Palace. I assure you, I want this out of us more than you do, and I'm going to push to get us back to the People's Palace as fast as we can. Besides needing to get there simply to heal us, we need to get there ahead of Hannes Ark. I'm pretty sure that's where he's headed. We have to push hard and get there first. I need to help them prepare for what is coming and set up defenses. The army needs to protect cities in the way of Hannes Ark and his half-people. Irina seemed confused as she looked from one face to another. Her frown turned back to him. Richard, it can't wait until then. It needs to be done now. Right now. 
Zed paused from scraping the rest of his stew over to the edge of his tin bowl where he could scoop it all up. We are all concerned about healing them, although you may not believe it. As his grandfather, I am even more concerned than you, Irina. That is above all else in all our minds at all times. Good. So then we should... She began again. But we have to get to the palace in order to do that healing. Zed continued with the solemn weight of authority as first wizard. Irina threw her arms up. Dear creator, aren't any of you people listening? It can't wait that long. It has to, Zed told her. We need a containment field in order to do it. A containment field? Why? She gestured towards Zed, then at Niki. We have a wizard and, well, three sorceresses, actually, right here, right now. We can all link our gift to multiply our power. Our linked ability will be strong enough to draw that deadly poison out of them. We need to get it out now. That's all there is to it. We need to get it done at once. We agree with you that it needs to be removed, and believe me, we share that urgency. Zed set down his bowl without taking the last bite. But I'm telling you, it must be done in a containment field. As well as Richard knew his grandfather, he knew that something was wrong. And Zed was trying to avoid saying that something aloud. Are you crazy, old man? Irina said as she scowled at Zed. It can't wait for the luxury of being at a palace to take care of it. It will have to. Zed told her with a kind of quiet insistence that covered some deeper worry. It's not a matter of the luxury of being at a palace, but having the proper tools to do the job. The taint they have in them is the call of death itself. If we try to extract it outside of a containment field, it would do the same thing to them as it did to Jit. It would call death to them. The only way to get it out without killing them and us along with them is to do it in a containment field. If we were to try to do it now, here, even if we link our gift, it won't matter. The attempt would kill them. Everyone fell silent. When he listened carefully enough, Richard was able to hear the faint sound of screams deep inside his mind. It was the open void within him between the world of life and the world of the dead. That gateway to the world of the dead was always there inside him and inside Colin, waiting to pull them through. Right then, he and Colin existed in both worlds. But with all the gifted talent we have here, we must try to do it now, Irina insisted. I'm telling you this for the last time, Irina, and you need to listen to me. It can only be removed in a containment field in order to safely trap and drain that poison. Zed said with quiet authority that was on the verge of outright anger. Otherwise, that poison will not only kill them, it will also kill any of us trying to draw it out of them. Richard and Colin shared a look. They both knew that it was getting worse. They could both feel that darkness trying to pull them in. They both knew that Zed was right. Irina stammered. They won't live that long. The surprise of her words sent an icy chill through Richard. What? I admit, she said, I am not as experienced at healing as a wizard, but even I can tell from sensing with my gift what was in you that you don't have that long to live. Richard, you will never make it that far. You won't live long enough to make it even halfway back to the People's Palace. You have no chance of making it the whole way. None. Richard and Colin both looked at Zed. He didn't look back at them. Richard turned to Nikki, expecting an answer. Nikki stared back into his eyes for a long time before she finally gave him that answer. I'm afraid she's right, Richard. We intend to try, of course, to use our ability to give you both strength for as long as we can, but we know that the reality is you won't live long enough to make it to the People's Palace. But... Richard searched for words. There must be something. Nikki looked away from him as she answered, Richard... We worked on you ever since the moment we got across the chasm. You were... You were close to death that whole time. Colin's infection was worse before, but the poison in you has caught up with hers, and you are both slipping away. This morning, we lost you to that poison. Richard frowned at her. What are you talking about? You stopped breathing. Death was taking you. You were at the cusp of death and crossing over. We were losing you. Zed did something that pulled you back. Another few heartbeats would have been your last had he not done what he did. Richard looked over at Zed. His grandfather's hazel eyes finally turned up to meet his gaze. 
I know what I'm doing. A sly smile creased his weathered face. I still have a few tricks left in me. It made Richard smile. Despite the gravity of the situation, it made him smile. Yes, you do. All we can do, Nikki said, is try to keep you alive as long as possible. But the truth is, you don't have long enough to live to make it back to the containment field at the palace. Irina looked around at everyone else. Well, all right. If it really needs to be done in the containment field and the people's palace is too far, then we simply need to use another one, somewhere closer, that's all. Containment fields are quite rare, Zed said with a heavy sigh. I hardly think we'll find one in the dark lands of all places. Yes, you will, she said. Zed's brow drew down, hooding his eyes as he looked intently at her. Where? Ah, so now you want to listen to me? This is a matter of life and death, Irina. There is no time for games. If you know of any closer containment fields, then tell us where they are. I only know of one, actually, she said. It's at the Citadel. Everyone stared at her. A real, functioning containment field? Zed asked, from a time when our ancestors still possessed such powers that could create such wonders? Irina nodded, looking a bit confused at their skepticism. A real containment field? He pressed again. A real, working containment field? At the Citadel, in Saavedra, in the heart of the Darklands. Again, Irina nodded. I have been to important palaces, built back in those ancient times, Nikki said, that weren't important enough to possess a containment field. I find it more than a little difficult to believe that there would be one out here in the Darklands at a petty citadel in Saavedra. How can you be so sure that you're right? I've been there, she said. I've seen it. Nikki still looked more than a little skeptical. What would a containment field be doing out here in the Darklands? Well, she said, I imagine that it was placed there because of the barrier being so close. My suspicion is that the people who built the barrier thought it would be a good idea to have one handy, if need be, when the barrier finally failed, or maybe for when the occult forces started seeping out before it failed. That actually makes a lot of sense, Richard said. Naja said that they knew the barrier would fail. They knew what we would face when it did. They might have left it there as a precaution to help us, for just such a problem as Jit created. Zed rubbed his chin. That's true. Richard had an even more disturbing thought. Those people back then knew a lot more about prophecy than we do. They knew a great deal about the events happening now. They may even have known that the Mother Confessor and I would need it. Zed arched a bushy eyebrow. That doesn't seem entirely outside the realm of possibility. They might have known it would be needed, Samantha said, silent up until then, because you are the one. Zed's frown was back. The one? What one? The one to stop what is happening now. Zed could only let out a deep sigh before looking back at Irina with a more important matter at hand. Do you know how to get to Saavedra? She pointed to the southeast. It's off in that direction. It's certainly a lot closer than the palace. Richard frowned. You live in the remote village of Stroiza. What were you doing at the Citadel in Saavedra? The woman looked flustered to be questioned about her reasons. Well, after my sister Millicent and her husband had been at the Abbey for a time, I feared for them. I had heard that people taken to the Abbey were usually never seen again. We don't get much news in Stroiza, so I don't know what goes on there. But I had heard of relatives going to the Abbey to plead for their loved ones to be released from service to the abbot. Knowing that such pleas never worked, and since I am a sorceress, I went instead to the citadel in Saavedra to plead directly to the bishop to try to get my gifted sister and her husband released because they were needed for our important duty at Stroiza. I thought that perhaps I could appeal to him as one of the gifted in his service and get him to order their release. What did Hannes Ark have to say? Richard asked. Irina rubbed the palms of her hands on her knees. I met with the bishop's scribe every morning asking for an audience. One was never granted. The scribe told me the bishop was a busy man. I asked him to relay the request, but I never got an audience, so I never was able to petition directly to the bishop for the release of my sister. But while I was there, waiting every day in hopes of an audience being granted, pacing or sitting around the citadel's grand entrance, the guards got used to me being around. They had heard me speak with the scribe every morning, and so they knew what I wanted, but they could do nothing to help me. 
One day the captain of the guards, who felt sorry for me, asked, since I was a sorceress in service, if I would like to have a tour of the Citadel to help pass the time while I awaited word on my petition. Being from a very tiny village, it was a rare opportunity. Even though I was distraught, I accepted the offer. During that tour, he showed me the containment field. It was deep down underground. Why would he show you a containment field? Niki asked. They are usually heavily guarded and often shielded. Irina's gaze roamed as she tried to recall the event. Well, the guard told me that the area around it gave people goose flesh, so they stayed well away from the place. He said that being a sorceress, he thought I would appreciate seeing it. Since I'm from Stroiza, I don't know what is commonly done elsewhere to protect such places. While he stood outside, I briefly went into the stone room. It was pretty plain, old, and covered with dust. There were shackles on one wall. I was more concerned about speaking with the bishop than inspecting the room. There really wasn't anything to see anyway, so I left. But the point is, it was a containment field. I could feel the power of the shields as I walked through the doorway. And it's a lot closer than the People's Palace. We can make it there in time. We can heal Richard and Colin there. It's their only chance. Zed and Niki stared at each other. They both smiled. We're fortunate that Hannes Ark is no longer at the Citadel to interfere, Richard said. Unfortunately, he is headed to the People's Palace. I'd planned to push and get around them so we could reach the palace first. We need to alert the people there. But at least Hannes Ark will not be at the Citadel. Chapter 45 Irina leaned in. If, as you say, Hannes Ark has deserted the Citadel, then that makes it all that much easier to borrow the containment field so that we can heal the two of you. In the back of his mind, Richard remembered Zed's frequent admonition. Nothing is ever easy. He looked over at his grandfather. What do you think? Zed's hazel eyes turned to look from under his brow at Irina, then back at Richard. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Richard wasn't surprised that Zed was thinking the same thing he was. The palace was a known quantity. The Citadel wasn't. He looked over at Niki. He noticed that she had not eaten much of her stew. Well? Well, she said, if there really is a functioning containment field there, it's your only chance to live. I just hope Zed and I can keep you and Colin alive until we can get there. Richard nodded before looking to Colin's green eyes. What do you think? I want to live. And I want you to live. I don't really see that we had any alternative. Richard didn't see one either. But that didn't mean he had to be happy about it. A lot of other lives were at stake. He needed to get to the palace. He let out a deep sigh as he gazed up at the darkening sky. All the leaves had stilled as the light breeze had died out. Night was closing in around them. Their time was running out. Colin's time was running out. The palace was too far. More than anything else, he could not bear the thought of Colin dying. He would do anything he had to do, anything, to keep her alive and out of the clutches of what Sulachan had waiting for her in the underworld. While he feared his own fate there, he feared any harm coming to Colin far more. All right, he said with finality to all the people watching him, we go to the Citadel. That means a change of other plans, though. What do you mean? Zed asked. No one at the People's Palace has any idea what is coming their way. Hannes Ark and Emperor Sulachan have an army of half-people and all the dead they could possibly need. The palace is built to withstand a siege from an army, but this is something different. Everyone at that palace needs to understand the nature of what is headed there so they can prepare. Prepare? Irina exclaimed. The people there have no chance. If they stay, they will be trapped there and slaughtered. Hannes Ark and his forces will kill anyone who resists. The situation is hopeless. The palace has to be evacuated. It's the only chance those people have. Richard regarded her alarm calmly. Accepting that a situation is hopeless ensures that it is. Defeat is not an option I accept. We need to figure out a way to win. Zed cleared his throat. While I don't agree with Irina that the situation is hopeless, I don't see how we can fight this threat. A number of painful lessons have shown us that magic doesn't work against many of the half-people. Hannes Ark and Emperor Sulachan have powerful occult abilities. Perhaps even more frightening, they and many of the half-people can raise the dead to send against us. 
I don't need to remind you that it's pretty hard to kill someone who is already dead. You're right, Richard said. Magic doesn't work all that well against most of the half-people. And weapons don't work well against the dead they send at us. But our small force here has proven that we can fight against great numbers of the half-people. We also know that, as difficult as it is, we can defeat their dead warriors. They can be stopped with any kind of fire, for one thing, and they can be hacked to pieces. The Spirit King, risen from the dead, is from that ancient time when people wielded powers that no longer exist. In the world the way it is now, I doubt he has any equal. Hannes Ark, too, is able to wield powerful occult sorcery. After all, Hannes Ark did bring Sulachan back from the world of the dead. I can't even imagine the two of them working together. That's what I mean, Irina insisted. Trying to fight such occult powers is hopeless. If you accept that it's hopeless, then you are doomed to that fate. Irina spread her arms in frustration. How do you propose we fight such powers? Magic doesn't work against them. Really? Well, despite their frightening occult powers and their numbers, little Samantha here proved all by herself that they are vulnerable in some ways to what can be done with magic if you are not willing to accept failure. Samantha silently beamed with pride. I'm not saying it will be easy, Richard told them. I'm saying that it must be done. We can't let them take the world into the nightmare they envision. Everyone looked grim. The people at the palace don't stand a chance unless they understand the true nature of what's coming and are prepared. Collins said with quiet resignation, We need to warn them. Richard nodded. Exactly. But warn them to do what? Zed asked. I certainly don't think we should give up hope or abandon the palace as Irina suggested, but how can the people there fight what's headed their way? Out on the Azareth Plain, there are no cliffs we can bring down on top of them. They are gifted there, Richard said. There are sisters of the light there. Nathan is there. Most of his life has been spent studying prophecy, history, and all sorts of forgotten matters having to do with magic. He often knows about things we've never even heard of before. He may be able to provide valuable information on what we can do. If nothing else, he can lay down wizard's fire on the legions of walking dead. Also, the palace has natural defenses. As long as they know what is coming, they can shut the great inner door, and they can seal off the tombs so that Sulachan can't raise the dead within the palace. The first file is there, and they have special weapons, remember? Niki frowned. Special weapons? Nathan found red-fletched bolts for the crossbows. They were relics from the Great War left hidden in the palace. They have some kind of ancient power that can penetrate shields and magic. Since they were from back in that time, maybe they can take down those with occult powers the way they can the gifted. Zed nodded in thought. Richard is right. The palace must be defended. There are incredibly valuable and dangerous things there. Books of magic and items of great power. It would be disastrous if Hannes Ark got his hands on them. Richard rubbed his forehead as he considered. The first file will never surrender. It's not in their nature. We need to warn them what is coming so they can prepare as best they can. They will hold off Hannes Ark and Sulachan's army. For a time, Colin said. For a time. Richard agreed. If Hannes Ark and that unholy spirit king aren't stopped, the first file must hold the palace. At least until we can be cured at the Citadel and get there. Until then, they need to send the army out to help protect the cities in the way of the advancing horde. They need to do what they can to keep Hannes Ark from capturing cities and laying waste to the places on the way to the palace. Do you seriously think any of that is going to work, or do any good at all? Irina asked. Yes, Richard said. I will make it work. I will not allow the world to be lost to this madness. I am the Lord Rawl. The people of Dahara are depending on me to be the magic against magic. I will not abandon them to such a threat. I will find a way. There is no other option. If I have to come back from the dead to fight for our people, I will. No one said a word against the grim finality of his vow. Darkness was settling down around them. There was no time to waste. Richard reached an arm up and called out to get Commander Fister's attention. When he trotted over to them, Richard gestured to a rock and invited the man to have a seat. What is it, Lord Rawl? 
Who was our best rider? Richard asked him. Surprised by the question, the commander made a face. Lord Rawl, these men are all first file. They are all the best. You don't get to be one of the first file unless you are the best of the best at everything. Few men make the cut. Just pick one, Lord Rawl, and he can do whatever job you ask of him. We need to get word to the palace, Richard told him. We only have one horse. We can't afford to have him be too slow or get caught, and yet he must take care not to kill his horse by driving it too hard. He must reach the palace as soon as possible with my orders. What orders, if you don't mind me asking? What does he need to tell them? We must warn the palace that Hannes Ark is coming with an army of half-people and likely legions of the dead. There is a lot of the dark lands the rider will have to get through before he ever makes it back to the palace. And he will also have to somehow get around Sulachan and his forces. It is absolutely essential that our man make it there with instructions. He cannot fail. Then we should send Ned. Commander Fister said after a moment's thought, He was born in the Darklands. He grew up in this vile place. A ways southwest from here, I think he said. Southwest is the direction he needs to go to get back to the palace from here. He would best know the lay of the land. Nikki looked up. Ned. He is the one who was attacked right after Richard saw those people who vanished. When the Shuntuck first attacked us. That's the man, the commander confirmed. He would have the best chance to get through. He's tough, he knows the countryside, and he's a good rider. Like the rest of the men, he doesn't know the meaning of giving up. Lucky, Nikki said. Richard looked over at her. Her knees were drawn up with her arms locked around them. Her chin rested on her knees. Lucky, he asked. She looked into his eyes. Lucky that he didn't get eaten. Lucky the Lord Rawl would not abandon his people. She pointedly didn't look at Irina, who had wanted to leave the man to his fate during that first attack. Not wanting to get into it, Richard merely nodded before looking back at the commander. Good. Then it is, then. It's getting dark fast. I want to talk to him before he goes off to get some sleep. There's a lot he needs to know. I have a number of orders for those at the palace. I want him to get a good rest. Then, in the morning at first light, before he leaves... I want to talk to him again to make sure he remembers it all. Commander Fister nodded. Anything else, Lord Rawl? I hear that it was an exhausting, hard-fought battle with those Shuntuck for most of last night. Everyone needs a good rest. In the morning, we all leave for Saavedra. And there is no time to waste on that journey, Irina chimed in as she shook a finger at the man. We need to get there as quickly as possible. Commander Fister smoothed a hand back over his hair. Sabedra, he said as he thought about it. He finally looked up. I'm sorry to admit it, Lord Rawl, but I don't know for certain where exactly Sabedra is located. Irina says that it's to the southeast. She will lead us. Irina looked surprised. Richard, I don't know the land well enough. I set out from Stroiza by trail and then rode when I went to Sabedra that one time. Other than that, I rarely left Stroiza. Since you rescued us from beyond the North Wall, we've been running all over creation. I don't really know for sure exactly where we are now. At least not well enough to lead us to Savedra. It's a big enough city that there will be roads going there, Richard said. We know the general direction, so sooner or later we will run into a road that leads to Savedra. I'll ask Ned as well. The commander offered, I imagine he has a pretty good idea of the direction and how to get there. Richard nodded. I also want double watches tonight. Commander Fister clapped a fist to his heart. Already done, Lord Rawl. And Commander, Richard said, making the man turn back. I want everyone to stay alert. There is a creature out there in the woods that has been watching us. Commander Fister frowned as he scanned the woods briefly. A creature? What sort of creature? Richard gestured in the direction he had last seen the thing, in the woods behind Colin. It's back that way. Some kind of mountain cat. Dark spots on its back. It's been watching us, but I don't think it means us any harm, or it would have already caused it. Just be aware. What color are its eyes? Colin asked. Richard thought it an odd question. Green? Leave him be, she said. He won't hurt us. He's just curious. Richard arched an eyebrow at Colin. He? His name is Hunter. Colin smiled at him as she dismissed it with a coy shrug. Just a little friend I met while you were off visiting the underworld. Hunter. You named him. It was not a question, but a reminder of what he had told her once before. 
She shrugged again. He brought me three rabbits. Seemed a pretty obvious name. That's where you got the rabbits for the stew? The commander asked in astonishment. I'd been wondering. He slept with me last night, Colin told Richard. I was upset and afraid for you. The little thing kept me warm and kept me company. You named him. Richard said again in admonishment. Colin smiled at him. Her own green eyes sparkled. He needed a name. Of course he did, Richard said as he shook his head. Chapter 46 What are you doing up? Zed asked as Richard stepped closer in the darkness. The flickering light from the low fire in the distance made Zed's wavy white hair look a little like it was made of flames. I was asleep all day, Richard reminded him. I'm not really tired. I want to check on the men standing watch. Ah, Zed said with a nod. What are you doing up? Richard asked his grandfather. Zed stroked a finger along his lower lip. I confess that I saw you go by and I wanted to talk to you, alone. Ah, Richard said with a nod. Maybe something about the bringer of death? Zed smiled in a way Richard knew well. Ever since he had been a boy, when Richard caught on before his grandfather had finished explaining, Zed would give him that particular smile. Well, yes, that was one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. Would you like to tell me about it? Or am I going to have to drag it out of you one question at a time? Richard held up a hand in surrender. No, I've been wanting to tell you what I've learned in the hopes that maybe you could shed some light on it. So... What was written in the language of creation on those walls you found in Stroiza? I found an account written by Naja Moon. She was a sorceress who worked with Magda Cirrus in Merit. Zed arched an eyebrow in wonder. Remarkable. I've never read anything from anyone so close to them. It was remarkable to read her account of that time, Richard said. She explained how Emperor Sulichan had conjured weapons out of people during the Great War and in the process learned how to animate the dead, in part by drawing their souls back out from the world of the dead. Zed shook his head with a troubled look. Crossing the boundaries between the worlds of life and death in such a way requires powers I can't begin to fathom. Had I not seen the dead reanimated with my own eyes, I would not believe it true. Not just said that when the half-people were originally created... He instilled occult ability in some to enable them to revive the dead, the same as Sulichan and his wizards were able to do. In the process of creating them, the spirits of those original half-people were discarded and left to wander forever between worlds. Zed lifted a finger with a sudden thought. Those people that you said snuck up on you when you were on watch and then vanished. Do you think... Richard was nodding. I think they very well might have been some of those lost souls who wandered back into this world, looking for where they belong. Zed shook his head. The poor souls. Indeed, Naja mentioned that some of them show up in this plane of existence and cause trouble. Sometimes they even harm people here. Much like the half-people. Richard nodded. The half-people want a soul and think that they can get one by devouring the living to get one and the lost souls want to be able to find the place they belong. Sulachan doomed both to never being at peace. The wrinkles in Zed's face deepened with a troubled frown. He idly rubbed a hand back and forth across his mouth as he considered it. His hazel eyes finally turned to Richard. And what does the bringer of death have to do with all that? Richard rested the palm of his left hand on the hilt of his sword. According to Naja, Despite everything they tried in order to stop Sulachan's creations, in the end, all they could do to keep from being annihilated was to build the barrier to lock that evil away. Richard smiled. I guess they did much the same as you did long ago when you created the boundaries to lock Dahara and the House of Rawl away so that the Midlands and Westland could live in peace. Zed nodded and thought, Yes, except that by comparison... I built a little fence out of sticks while those people back in the Great War built a fortress wall out of stone. Mine lasted decades, while theirs lasted thousands of years. Richard nodded, but both were still fated to eventually fail. Naja knew that the barrier, much like the boundaries you put up, wouldn't last forever, and then the people of the New World would once again have to face the evil they had locked away. 
She said that they could do no more than leave people to stand watch. I know the feeling, Zed said deep in thought. That's all I had been able to do. Block evil away for a time. Sometimes you can't eliminate evil. You can only keep it contained. Naja also explained, much the same as that Shuntuk prisoner told us, that Sulichan's plan is to dissolve the boundary between life and death in order to rule a united world where life and death exist together. It wouldn't be the world of life anymore, or the world of death, but a third kingdom. Zed looked up from his thoughts. That's crazy. Yes, but because of the forces he is using, occult powers that can not only bend but break the elements of the grace, the mere attempt no matter how crazy, could very well destroy the world of life. Zed peered at Richard. Do you think him more powerful than the Keeper of the Underworld? That's like saying that one man is more powerful than all of creation, and he can take over and dictate everything in life, from how fast grass grows to how high birds can fly to how people must serve him. Thinking he can rule life and death is the very definition of delusional. Look, Zed. I'm not arguing that the man can do what he wants, and neither was Naja. The point is that by the things he has done, creating the half-people, animating the dead, and pulling spirits out of the world of the dead into this world, Naja's people were sure that he has the wherewithal to rip the veil. That's all that really matters. I still say it's delusional. It may be delusional to think you can steal a man's thoughts by breaking his head open with a rock to have a look at them, but the man with the head full of thoughts is dead either way. Zed grunted unhappily. I suppose you're right. Did she offer any solution? Any answers? She said that Sulichan's scheme could only be stopped by the bringer of death. Zed shot Richard a sharp look. What is the bringer of death supposed to do to stop such powers? Richard's gaze wandered across the dark woods. The low clouds had drifted silently back overhead and blanketed the heat of the day, so that it wasn't as cold as Colin said it had been the night before, when he had been at death's door. Have you ever heard of something called the Twilight Count? He finally asked his waiting grandfather. No, I can't say that I have. What is it? I don't know. The way Naja talked about it makes me think it might have something to do with the chronology of prophecy, like a calendar of prophecy or something. It involved some kind of formal calculation, but she didn't explain it. I guess because people in her time knew all about it. She did say that they were able to determine from this twilight count that prophecy holds the key to stopping the threat. Prophecy. Zed's face twisted with a sour expression. It would have to be prophecy. Actually, you may be surprised to hear that she said the threat can only be ended by ending prophecy. Zed's frown deepened. Ending prophecy? How in the world are we supposed to end prophecy? Richard looked over at his grandfather. We? Naja said that according to the Twilight Count, prophecy can only be ended by the bringer of death. That means it can only be ended by me. Samantha called you the one. What's that about? Richard shrugged. In many different ways, books of prophecy have all identified me as the bringer of death. In the same way, they say I'm the one who is supposed to stop Sulichan by ending prophecy. I think that's why Samantha and the sorceresses of Stroiza have always expected the One to come along and solve the problem they are there to watch over. It could be that they have been taught that the right person would come along at the right time. Or it could be something as simple as them knowing that the barrier would eventually fail, and they assume that when it did, someone would come along and set things right. That makes sense, too, Richard said. People are always looking for a simple answer looking for the one who will solve their problems. Zed clasped his hands behind his back. Sounds simple enough. It was Richard's turn to frown. Simple? Certainly. The barrier comes down, as Naja's people knew it would. The people of Stroiza were meant to watch for that event. Even if, over the centuries, they lost the ability to read Naja's message, they probably continued to pass the general concept down from generation to generation, teaching their children that when the barrier failed, they had to report it and someone would stop the threat. Over time, the gifted of Stroiza might have simply come to think of that person as the one. Richard shot his grandfather an unhappy look. It may sound simple, but the problem is, I'm the one named in prophecy, and 
I don't have any idea how to end prophecy. Zed's sour expression returned. Yes, that part does sound tricky. That isn't all, Richard said, as he showed Zed his ring with the grace on it. Magnusiris and Merritt left it for me. Zed frowned. The first confessor herself? That would be the one. How do you know it's for you? Was there a message with it? Richard nodded. There were three emblems written in the language of creation hidden in a shielded door along with this ring. They have been hidden there, undisturbed and undiscovered for 3,000 years. The first of the three emblems said, If you are reading this, it is because you are the bringer of death and the barrier has been breached. What we could not stop, you now face. War is upon you. Well, that certainly seems to confirm the business, with you being the one. What about the other two emblems? Richard squinted in thought, making sure he got the words right. The second said, Know that you are the only chance life has now. Know, too, that you are balanced between life and death. You have the potential to be the one to save the world of life or end it. You are not destined for anything. You make your own destiny. That sounds like it's referring to the poison in you, Zed said. The touch of death you carry means you are balanced between the world of life and the world of the dead. That's what I thought, Richard said. But the problem is that the combinations of cause and effect that result in me being the one to save life, or to end it, are so complex. And there are so many variables that I don't know how what she said is supposed to do me any good. Zed made a sound of agreement deep in his throat. What about the third part? Did that shed any light on it? Not really. The third emblem said, Know that you have within you what you need to survive. Use it. Seek the truth. Know that our hearts are with you. Make your own destiny and make it true, for life hangs in the balance. We leave you a reminder to keep with you of all that is important. Magna Cirrus and Wizard Merritt wanted me to have this ring as a reminder of what we all fight for. Zed considered the words in silence. Do you have any idea what I should do? Richard finally asked. Zed's face turned away to stare off into the darkness. As a matter of fact, my boy, I do. Chapter 47 Richard frowned over at his grandfather, his face shadowed by the light of the campfire. Really? You know what I need to do? Zed grunted with a nod. I do. As a matter of fact, that is what I wanted to talk to you about. It's why I came out here, to speak with you alone. The message from Magda and Merritt only confirms my thoughts. Richard rubbed the creases in his forehead. He stopped when he realized that he was trying to rub away the distant sounds of screams deep in his own mind. He focused instead on the buzz and chirp of night insects. Silhouetted against the faint light of the sky, he could see bats from time to time as they silently swooped by on erratic courses to catch flying bugs. I could use some advice about now, Zed, Richard said in a quiet voice. I'm about at my wit's end. Everyone is depending on me. Zed looked over at him. In the hard angles of the old man's face, Richard could see that it was one of those troubled looks that told him this was as serious as Zed got. My boy, after we get to the Citadel and remove that poison from you, I think you should quit. Richard stared for a moment, not sure he had heard correctly. What are you talking about? Quit? What do you mean? Just what I said. Quit. Give it all up. Richard frowned, trying to understand. Give what up? Everything and everyone. It's time you and Colin lived your lives for each other. You've both sacrificed your lives together and given up everything you could have with each other in order to fight on behalf of everyone else. I think the time has come for you both to give up everything else and go live for yourselves, for your own happiness. You have done enough, Richard. You have done more than enough. Richard was stunned. Richard knew by his grandfather's tone of voice that he was deadly serious. I don't understand, it said. How can I possibly do such a thing when everyone is depending on me? Zed let out a sigh. Richard, 
The world was getting by for a very long time before you ever came along. How many times throughout history has disaster been right around the corner? How many times has the world of life been threatened and on the brink? Such things have been going on since long before you ever came along to save the day. Yes, but this is one of those threats that even the people back in the Great War warned about. And they identified me as the only one who would have a chance to stop it. This is the time when I'm the one meant to step in and act. Zed thought about his answer for a moment. Since the dawn of man, there have always been people bent on harming others. There have been periods of peace and enlightenment, and there have been dark times. But through it all, mankind survived. That cycle has repeated itself over and over. It wasn't always easy. And despite those who would have it otherwise, life went on. Richard let out a sigh of his own. It seems like people would learn from that and let others live their lives. Zed shrugged. I personally believe that it's a basic flaw in mankind's makeup. What do you mean? What sort of flaw? Hate. I believe it is a fundamental defect in mankind. While other creatures live to nurture and live their lives, only some of mankind lives that way. Sure, there are both good and bad people. I don't understand what you mean by a flaw, though. Well, revulsion, hate, is a fundamental function of nature. Hate is a judgment, and judgment is necessary to life. Mice hate owls, so they hide. Rabbits hate wolves. That judgment makes them always ready to run. It's necessary and natural to be repelled by things that are harmful to life. It's a built-in natural protective mechanism. We don't have to think it through each time because the judgment is automatic. We hate the smell of corpses, for example. We hate it when thieves steal what belongs to us. We hate murderers. It's natural to hate those things, the same way it is natural for birds to hate cats and make a racket in protest whenever one roams by. Some of Richard's earliest memories were of Zed speaking in this role, passing along lessons. So he simply listened as his grandfather went on. Hatred of the smell of corpses makes us bury or burn the dead, which keeps us from getting diseases. Hatred of thieves prompts us to guard against those who would sneak in and steal the food from our children's mouths. We hate murderers because they steal our lives. That kind of hatred breeds caution and causes us to take measures to protect ourselves. We lock doors. We carry weapons. We take a variety of measures to protect our loved ones from those who would cause them harm. In animals, that hatred stops there. A rabbit does not hate sheep, for example. You will see rabbits and sheep eating grass side by side. Animals will protect their own territory so that they can provide for themselves and their young, but they don't take more territory simply to possess it. In humans, we communicate, enabling us to pass our judgment on to others. We might say, I hated traveling that route because it's so steep that I almost fell and broke my neck. That judgment, framed in the emotion of hate, is so basic to our nature that it is easily transferred to others. But, in many people, that capacity for hatred loses its natural, rational motive. The emotion runs wild and becomes their dominant trait. They are no longer able to appreciate the good in anything. Having lost the link to rational purpose, they react purely on the emotion. Because of the power of that emotion, their minds become set in that single direction. It becomes so all-consuming that many of those people lose even their capacity to love life. They can only hate. The good in life is what quenches hatred in normal people, the way a smile can calm a quarrel. But in those people who carry this flaw... Their hatred burns so hot they come to hate what is good in life specifically because they don't want to stop hating. Hatred becomes the driving purpose of their lives. They live to hate. That flaw twists nature in on itself. In order to preserve their state of hatred, they must attack the good, wipe away that smile, so to speak. 
that single-minded emotion of hate, has been a fundamental, inherent flaw in mankind's nature since the dawn of time. It drives people to fight, to conquer, to dominate, to destroy. Hatred has such powerful emotions attached to it that others take it up out of fear. In that way, hate spreads like a panic in a crowd. Expanded beyond its rational bounds, hate exists entirely in the realm of raw emotion, where it ceases to serve a useful purpose, and instead becomes a powerful corrosive that eats away at the fabric of civilization itself, at the very ability of people to interact peacefully. It spawns fights among children and among neighbors. It spawns wars. It spawns genocide and slaughter. It's present in every great land and every tiny village. It creates bullies and tyrants. That unquenchable, passionate, rampant flaw is universal throughout mankind. One of the wizard's rules, actually. There have always been those who hate, and there always will be. You can't change it. You can only try to keep such people from harming you. For if they can, they will. In many ways, fighting them only reinforces that emotion of hate. Even protecting yourself from them only makes them more determined to cause you harm. People born with that inherent, tragic defect are like a, an animal born without eyes. They can only perceive things through the prism of hate. Since they have, in a way, lost their ability to see, lost that compassionate, tolerant connection to the rest of humanity, they have, in a way, lost their souls. The half-people are driven by their nature of being born without a soul, so that trait drives them to behave the way they do. It is a fundamental flaw in their nature that cannot change. Everything they do is driven by that flaw. In much the same way, those driven by hate are like the half-people, and in a fundamental way they too are alive, but without a soul. Both are driven by their inherent defect, to destroy life that is complete and wholesome. That hatred is so all-consuming in some that they would even deliberately destroy themselves if it enabled them to destroy others along with them. Hatred provides them with a justification for every sort of evil. People who carry this inherent trait have been around long before you ever came along, Richard, and they will be around long after you were gone. It's a constant struggle for balance in mankind itself. Those who create and those who want only to destroy. But we can't let them win, Richard insisted. Zed smiled sadly. Even if you win this battle, the next day someone else will rise up. This is the basic struggle for mankind's destiny. The struggle between civilized reason and savage emotion. It is endless and will go on until it eventually destroys the human race. In a perverse way, such evil is encouraged by the mere act of trying to do right by others. That good inflames their hate, drives them on. So, in a way, trying to do good only feeds evil. Maybe the meaning of ending prophecy to stop Sulichan is that you must end life itself. Perhaps it is nature's intent for mankind to die out, because the defect disqualifies us as a viable species. Perhaps our species does not deserve to survive. In the end, it's a self-canceling flaw in mankind. After all, if those who hate win, then mankind itself is destroyed. Who are you to decide what the outcome of nature should be, that our species deserves to survive? In a way, your thinking that you can decide the course of nature is just as deluded as Sulichan's. Who are you in the scheme of things? If it is nature's way to correct its mistakes, then mankind will die out. If that is the case, it matters little what you do. If the die is cast, then if not this time, if not now, then perhaps right after you have left this life, having squandered your entire existence on an ultimately hopeless struggle, the world of man will end anyway. Perhaps on the day you die, and are no longer in the world of life, after fighting to save the good and decent people of the world, 
The final man will be born who will tip the scales and have what in his hatred of life he wants most, and finally succeed in throwing mankind into the oblivion of extinction. That is why I think you should choose to live your own life, Richard. Take what life you have left and live it for yourself. Leave this fight for mankind to mankind. Ease the world down off your shoulders. Take the weight off Colin's shoulders. She carries that weight in part because you choose to do so. Let her live, Richard. Let yourself live. But I am the Lord Rawl. Are you doing any of this in order to rule? No. You are not fighting so that others will lift you up as an emperor. You instead want to lift others by letting them live up to their own potential. You are not struggling to rule, but to give others a chance at ruling their own lives. So stop ruling and let them live those lives. It should not be up to you alone to fight on behalf of life. It should be up to everyone. That is how nature balances itself. If enough people are strong enough in their love of life, then mankind will survive. If there are too many who do not value their lives, but instead hate life and those who love it, then mankind will not survive. You alone can't tip the balance. Perhaps mankind does not deserve to survive. If that is the case, then nothing you do can really change the course. You have saved the day for everyone enough times, Richard, given them all another day to live. When is it time for your life, for you and Colin to live? I think the time has come for you to go off and save yourself. Leave the world of life to work it out on its own, the way all of nature in the end must do. Chapter 48 Richard couldn't believe what he was hearing, especially from Zed. It made him feel very lonely and very lost. It made the world seem too big, too overwhelming. After all you've taught me, Zed, how can you give me such advice? I am First Wizard Zedicus Zul Zorander. That's how. I too have lived, and live now again, for duty, as you do now. Perhaps I can see better from the perspective of my age what matters in life, what slips away from us when we aren't paying attention, when we're fighting all the time for others. Zed, I'm sorry, but I just don't know how you can suggest such a thing. Would you advise me to let everyone die? I can understand you telling me that I need to remember to live life along the way, but how can you suggest that I let Hannes Ark and Emperor Sulichan go on unchecked? They will kill countless people and very possibly destroy all of mankind in their crazy scheme to rule everything. Zed smiled sadly. There is always someone who wants to rule the world, my boy. Someone who wants power. Someone who is willing to kill everyone they need to kill in order to get what they want. Wizards rule, remember? There have always been those who hate. And there always will be. Is it your responsibility to save everyone from them? Richard searched for words. It kind of is, Zed. I'm Lord Rawl. I'm the head of the Daharan Empire. I took on that responsibility because I want people to be able to live in peace and safety. I am the Lord Rawl, who is the magic against magic. The holder of the bond, the one who is duty-bound to protect those people. Your duty. Zed sadly shook his head. Duty is overrated. And as for your bond, that sickness in you has taken that away. Richard ran his fingers back through his hair. I know, but if I don't, what did Magda Cirrus tell you? He rolled a finger. In that second emblem, what did she tell you? Richard thought a moment and then repeated the words. Know that you are the only chance life has now. Know, too, that you are balanced between life and death. You have the potential to be the one to save the world of life, or end it. You are not destined for anything. You make your own destiny. Zed arched an eyebrow at Richard. 
It seems to me she is giving you the same advice I'm giving you. You have the potential to be the one to save the world of life or end it. You are not destined for anything. You make your own destiny. That means that by interfering, trying to help since you have the touch of death in you, you might inadvertently be the one who causes the world of life to be ended. When she said that you are the only chance life has now, maybe she meant that you must walk away in order to give the world of life that chance. I had that same thought, Richard admitted, but I could also be the one to save it. What if it means that by giving up and not trying, then life will be destroyed? That would make it my fault. Richard recognized the mistake before he'd finished saying it. Zed didn't miss it either. Don't blame the victim for the crime. It is not your fault for what others choose to do. Don't let people hang guilt on you if you decide, after all you've done for everyone, after all the sacrifices you have made, to finally live your own life. Richard nodded. I know. But if I have the ability to help, and I don't, then I don't know how I could live with myself. Look, Richard, his grandfather said with a sigh, it's not like I don't understand. I've been in your place, where half the world depended on me to save them, while the other half was trying to kill me and those I loved. I carried the weight of the world on my shoulders, much as you do now. Richard shared a long look with his grandfather. So what did you do? After the world had knocked some sense into me, I did the same thing as I'm advising you to do. I left, quit everything, and went off to live my own life. You mean when you fled to Westland and let everyone think you were dead? Zed nodded as he stared off into the memories. I gave it all up and took your mother to Westland, where we lived our lives in peace and happiness. We had a good life until she died. Then, after that, I mostly had the joy of raising you away from that call of duty and those who would harm you, away from those who needed me. We had a good life, didn't we? Didn't we have the best time? Richard couldn't help smiling at the memory. We did. The best life ever. At least until the boundary failed and Dark and Rawl came after me. I miss it. The time when it was you and me. I miss Heartland. With his bony fingers, Zed gripped Richard's shoulder. My advice is that you do the same now, Richard, as I did. Take your precious wife and go off somewhere all alone with her. Find a safe place where you can be lost to everyone else. Leave the world to work out its own problems. While you love Colin, maybe raise a family of your own. Leave mankind to work it out, to either survive or drive itself into oblivion. Maybe your destiny... Your way of saving everyone is to have children and teach them as I have taught you. Richard felt a tear rolling down his cheek at such a thought. He remembered when Colin had been hurt so badly that he didn't know if she would live. She had lost her child to those brutes. She had almost lost her life. How could he live without her? Life would not be worth living without her. When she had been hurt so terribly, he had quit everything and taken her back deep into Westland, where no one lived, and built a small home where they could live in peace as she recovered. It was one of the happiest times of his life. It had been life, as Zed was telling him to live it now. He wondered if Zed could be right, if he was not only throwing away his own life on a hopeless quest to save mankind from itself, but also throwing away Colin's life. After all, Kara had eventually found happiness, and while she and her husband had been doing their duty, fighting those who lusted to destroy life, she had lost him and lost her chance at happiness. And for what? Was the world any better off? He felt sick and dizzy at the implications. He felt lost and confused. Zed, with so many good people depending on you. How could you make such a decision? I mean, how were you able to do it? Zed thought for a time. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. 
At the same time, it was easy, because I was doing it out of love for your mother and for you. Even though you hadn't been born yet, I wanted you both to have a life away from any duty but to live for the joy of living. In that time and place, while I had quit and was lost to the rest of the world, you learned what made you the man you are today. After all is said and done, Richard, perhaps Magda Cirrus was telling you the exact same thing. That you can't really save the world of life. And in fact, your attempt to do so may be what ends it. Maybe she also saw in the Twilight Count that you needed to take your own beloved confessor and go make your own destiny. Maybe ending prophecy meant to quit being a slave to it. With his left hand, Richard gripped the hilt of the Sword of Truth sheathed at his hip. He spoke softly, but firmly. I'm fighting for the kind of world I want to live in, Zed. The kind of world where people can live their lives for themselves. Where they can work, create, trade, and live without the threat of others taking everything from them. Much like the world you fled to and where you raised me. That's the kind of world I would wish to live in too, Richard. But it is nothing more than a wish. For those reasons and more, I know that I have grown tired of life. I'm weary of struggling against such endless depravity. It seems to me that there is less and less to live for all the time. The two people I love most in the world, you and Colin, seem condemned to lives of endless fighting and war that is gradually destroying everything good in the world. I ask myself all the time, what is there to live for anymore? I can't live in peace. My whole life, until I quit and fled to Westland, was spent in a life and death struggle with that evil. It never ends. I am tired of it. Tired of the struggle, tired of the withering plague of hatred, tired of everything. That is why I say you need to quit and enjoy what you can of your life while you have it, while you still can. Give it up, Richard. Go and live for yourself. Forget the rest of the world. Let the inevitable happen as it will. In the meantime, turn your back to all the hate. Take the joy you can and live for yourselves. Just as I did. You will find that after a time the savage streak in mankind becomes a distant memory and unimportant. Let it become unimportant to you and Colin. Richard fell back on what was most important to him. But fighting this struggle has also won me Colin. Zed shot him a look. Then take what you have won and walk away before you end up losing it. When you get that poison out of you, just walk away, Richard. That's my advice. Walk away before you lose it all. I will miss you and may die of a broken heart not to have you close to me, but I will be able to die happy knowing that you are happy and at peace somewhere with Colin. I will fight on, knowing that you two are safe and living life. I love you both and want you to have that life together. That's what love really is, you know. Wanting the best for those you love, no matter how much it may hurt you to let them go. Richard smiled then. Zed, how in the world could I ever be happy without you in my life? Ah, well, my boy, there is that problem. Chapter 49 Colin, are you awake? Colin looked back over her shoulder and saw that it was Nikki leaning down close. She turned and sat up. What is it? Nikki glanced at the empty bedroll. Where's Richard? Colin gestured across the encampment. He said that he wasn't tired after being unconscious for so long, so he wanted to go check on the sentries. He told me to get some rest, and he would be back soon. Why? What is it? Is something wrong? Nikki drew her lower lip between her teeth as she briefly glanced to each side. Can I talk to you? Privately? Colin was exhausted and in no mood to talk, but she knew that Nikki had to be just as tired. She also knew that the woman never engaged in idle chit-chat. If she wanted to talk, it was because it was important, or there was something wrong. Colin looked around. There were other people not too far away. 
They had wanted to keep the encampment tight in case there was an attack. Now that everyone was bedded down and quiet, they could easily be within earshot. Nikki had said privately. Colin pointed off to the side of camp. Sure, let's go over there. We can sit on that low boulder under the ash trees. Nikki glanced back at the place Colin had pointed to. That works. As it turned out, Colin was the one who sat on the rock and covered her yawn with a hand as Nikki paced before her. Colin waited, watching Nikki walk back and forth for a while, before she finally decided that the sorceress wasn't going to talk unless encouraged. Nikki, what is it? What's wrong? It occurred to Colin that it was a pretty open-ended question. There were whole constellations of things that were wrong. I don't trust Irina. That was not one of the stars that had been twinkling for attention among the constellations of problems in Colin's mind. She would have picked something like her and Richard being on death's doorway. All right, Colin said in an even tone. Nikki stopped pacing and faced her. Didn't you hear me? I'm telling you, I don't trust the woman. Colin shrugged. All right, why not? Nikki scowled. Do I need to have a reason? Colin thought about it a moment as Nikki stared at her. People usually found such a glare from the bewitching sorceress uncomfortable in the extreme, but Colin was not one of those people. She was in no mood for cryptic personal reports in the dead of the night. If there was a point, she wanted to hear it. Well, if you're asking me to cross her off the guest list for the next palace ball, I suppose I don't need to have your reasons. You've got it. Consider it done. But, on the other hand, if you are asking me for permission to kill the woman, then I guess I ought to hear your reasons. Nikki folded her arms as she went back to pacing. She huffed a sigh. Irina said that when the bones washed out of the swamp, she identified them as the remains of her sister. That's right. She said that she detected the residue of the gift in them, and she recognized it as her sister's gift. Nikki came to a halt and leaned toward Colin, arms still folded. Colin, I'm pretty experienced. I've been a sister of the light, a sister of the dark, and death's mistress. And I've never heard of the gift being detectable in bones. That gave Colin pause. You can't recognize traces of the gift in the bones of a person? No. Colin was surprised, but she was tired and didn't feel like working out what seemed like a trivial puzzle. Well, just because you never heard of it and you can't do it, that doesn't mean it can't be done. In this case, I'm pretty sure it does. By her tone of voice, Nikki was in no mood for games either. She expected her word in this to be taken seriously. I know a lot about the gift. I used to teach its use. I've worked and studied at the Palace of the Prophets for more than four of your lifetimes, plus the lifetimes of Irina and her daughter added in. I'm telling you, I know about these things, and you can't detect the gift in human remains, much less identify the person they came from. Maybe occult conjuring can do such things, but the gift cannot. She also said that she knew the captive had occult powers. Zed and I couldn't detect anything. Well, I admit that is kind of odd, but maybe, as she explained, living this close to the barrier, some people may have begun to accumulate some of those occult abilities. Maybe, Nikki admitted under her breath. Is that it? That's the reason you don't trust her? Nikki started pacing again. How did you get to Jit's lair and Karga Trace? Realizing that this was far from over, Colin pushed some of her hair back away from her face and turned more serious. I followed the road toward Karga Trace until it eventually diminished down into a small trail that led out across the swamp. The trail was hard to miss. It was built out of branches and saplings and such to keep you up out of the water. In some places, it was like a bridge, spanning long stretches of open water on its way to Jit's place. So it was all up above water where you could see it. Of course, you must know that, though. You would have had to come in the same way to get Richard and me out. Nikki confirmed with a nod that she did indeed know it. Irina said that none of her people knew where the hedge maid's lair was located in the swamp, so she didn't know where to look for her sister. Colin scratched an eyebrow. What of it? You found the way into Jits. That boy, Henrik, found his way in. People hoping to be healed found their way in. We found the trail made of branches and vines. It's the only way into the hedge maid's lair. None of us has ever been in the Darklands before, and we found it. Stroiza is the nearest village to Cargatrace. How could Irina not know where Jit's lair was, or about the trail across the swamp? Colin frowned. I don't know, Nikki. 
That does seem a bit strange, but then her people very well might stay close to their cave. The Dark Lands are dangerous. Samantha said that she had never really been anywhere until she went with Richard. Do you really think it's all that important? Is that reason enough not to trust her? Nikki stopped and gave Colin a cold glare. The woman is in love with Richard. So are you. Had it been any more light than just the moon through the cloud cover and the distant campfire, Colin was sure that she would have seen Nikki's face go scarlet. She went back to pacing for a bit before she spoke again. I don't know how to answer that, Colin. You know the entire situation better than anyone, except, I guess, for Richard. A lot of people love Richard, and in a lot of different ways. No one loves him the way you do. Richard loves no woman but you, in that way. You know what I mean. Colin didn't answer. Nikki flicked her hand in annoyance. Samantha is in love with Richard as well. I know that, Colin said. Nikki stopped her pacing again and faced Colin. But Samantha is an innocent young woman, and she is merely infatuated with a handsome, strong, wise, older man. It's innocent enough. Still, I don't trust her temper. It may be much the same with Irina, then, Colin offered. Just an innocent infatuation. Really? Nikki paused in her pacing to give Colin a look. The woman's husband was murdered not that long ago, eaten alive before her eyes. She seems to have gotten over it pretty quickly. We can't know that, Nikki. We don't know if she cries herself to sleep. I suppose, Nikki grumbled. She shook her head, but there is something about Irina that seems off. She tries to get close to Richard in a way I don't like. She is always putting her hands on him, touching him, fawning over him, keeping herself in his focus, trying to monopolize his attention. She growled in frustration. I don't know how to explain it. It gives you a knot in your stomach when you see her touching Richard, Colin said. Nikki stopped and pointed a finger at Colin. Yes, that's it. Me too, Colin said. Chapter 50. Nikki was caught off guard. You don't trust Irina either? Colin showed the woman a small smile. Nikki, I don't trust most people where Richard is concerned. I want him all to myself. But I know that he belongs to everyone, in a way, and I have to tolerate certain things. Like me? Colin was a long time answering. Nikki, at one time, I wanted nothing more desperately than to kill you. Over and over in every imaginable, horrible manner. I wanted to scream at you as I killed you a hundred times over. After all, you had been a sister of the dark. You were also a devoted, dedicated believer in the ways of the Imperial Order and Emperor Jagong, whose forces were slaughtering my people and trying to destroy our way of life. But worse, you took Richard captive and took him away from me away from everyone who needed him, for a very long time. I hated you. But Richard understood how the Imperial Order had controlled and conditioned you from a very young age. Despite that indoctrination, Richard saw something worthwhile deep down inside you. He saw that you were different, and that while you were disciplined in their ways, you were not blind. He only needed a way to encourage you to see again. Richard believed in you believed in your intellect, believed that you had the spark of spirit that could see things for yourself, that you had the capacity to see the truth. Over time, as you came to know him and understand him, you finally began to think through the reasons behind your loyalties. You used your head to try to reason out the why of things, and in so doing, you discovered the truth for yourself. In that instant, when reason won out over the blind faith you had been taught, you changed. You came to embrace life instead of death. You had the courage to see your own failings. You had the courage to see the harm you had done and the inner character to want to set it right. You have fought on our side since then, and you've proven yourself to me a thousand times over. You have saved both our lives on any number of occasions. You have helped bring truth to others. I came to understand how you were, in fact, also a victim of the same depraved ideology we were fighting. In a way, the Imperial Order had crushed you the same way it wanted to crush us. Because of what you did to lift yourself out of the darkness you were in, I was able to come to appreciate you for the woman you really were, underneath the things you did because of the corrupt doctrine you had been taught. 
I came to see your inner strength and the courage it took to face reality and step out of your darkness and into the light. Once that happened, I no longer had any reason to hate you. That hatred no longer served a purpose, so I was able to set it aside. That also means I have no reason to harbor bitterness or resentment against you. You've changed, and as a result, I've changed. We're both better for it. I know that you are still in love with Richard, but I also know that because you love him, you want him to be happy. You understand him now and know that the reality is you can't force someone to love you, but you still love him. You can't help how you feel, and I understand that. Sometimes a person can't talk their heart out of how it feels, despite how hard you try. But now you have placed that in perspective with what he wants for himself. Nikki swallowed. You're right about that. I can't help how I feel. I wish it were otherwise. I truly do. But I can't change my heart. I would do anything Richard asked of me. I would lay down my life if he asked it of me. I would do anything for him. But I would never again try to steal him from you because I know that would be treason against him. Because I love him, truly love him, I could never do that to him. Colin stared into Nikki's blue eyes. I know. She felt profound sorrow for Nikki. She couldn't imagine being as in love with Richard as she was and having him not love her back. That would be a living death. She hoped that one day Nikki could find a man worthy of her, the way Kara had, even if Kara's joy had been all too short. Nikki's gaze stayed on Collins. I had Richard down in the old world a long time. I came to know what it is in that man's heart. It matters not who loves him. All that matters is who he loves. And he loves you, Colin. Colin nodded. I know that too, Nikki. Nikki let out a relieved sigh. Good. So, Colin said after a moment's silence, you don't think Irina can really tell a person's gift from bones, unless, of course, she has powers you don't know about. Perhaps from living her whole life out here close to the power leaking out of that barrier to the Third Kingdom. And you think she should have known where the hedge maid lived. And she loves Richard. I don't know that she actually loves him, now that I think about it, so much as she seems obsessed with him. Even so, she has also fought beside us, fought to protect our lives. So, what do you expect me to do about her? I don't know, Nikki grumbled. Maybe tell me I'm crazy. I don't think you're crazy. I don't trust the woman either. Nikki halted her pacing and looked over at Colin. You alluded to that before. Mind telling me why not? Well, I know it sounds a bit intolerant, but I don't trust her because she calls him Richard instead of Lord Rawl. Nikki looked puzzled. Richard doesn't care about titles. That's beside the point. Titles imply things. Respect, for one. Country people from remote places like this are usually terrified of people with power. I've grown up seeing people pale when they heard my title announced. People fear what they don't know, and they fear power. A woman, even a sorceress from a little place like Stroiza, should be more respectful, if nothing else, of the leader of the Daharan Empire, the Lord Rawl himself. And the Mother Confessor, Nikki added. And the Mother Confessor, Colin agreed. It's a little thing but little things have reasons behind them. Little things can be a crack in a person's carefully constructed facade that allows you to look deeper inside them. Richard wouldn't care that she doesn't call him Lord Rawl, but I do, because it tells me that something deeper is going on, that there is something there that is not what it seems. Samantha is infatuated with him, as you say, but she still calls him Lord Rawl. That is consistent with how people typically behave. Nikki was frowning with concern. What do you think we should do about it? Be aware. Be vigilant. Always. Nikki looked off toward the camp. Richard is coming back. You had best go be with him and get some sleep. She smiled as she watched him walking silently among the sleeping men. Give him a hug. I think you could both use one. And I don't want you to worry. We should soon be to the citadel and that containment field, and then we will finally rid you of Jit's poison. Colin stood and gave Nikki a hug. I think you could use one as well. Nikki hugged her back. You do know, don't you? 
that I also love you. Colin smiled. I know. Colin knew that loving someone and being in love with someone were two very different things. Still, she trusted Nikki. After Nikki had taken Richard away, she had learned that she couldn't win his heart, and she eventually came around and did the most loving thing she could do. She brought him back to where his heart lay, brought him back to Colin. No one had hurt Colin more than Nikki, but she had set things right. Now, there was probably no one in camp Colin trusted more. Now, because she trusted her, she had to ask her a difficult question. Chapter 51 Nikki, can I ask you a hard question and get an honest answer? Of course. Colin stared off at the encampment for a moment without seeing it, trying to think of how to put such a thing into words, how to say it out loud. Saying it out loud somehow made it irrevocable. Finally, she asked as plainly as she could. How long do Richard and I have to live if we aren't cured? Well, Nikki said, thinking it over for a moment, that is a hard question to answer. And I don't want to hear things like, we have a while yet before we die, or not a terribly long time, or other wiggle words like that. I want the truth. I want to know. If we don't get this poison out of us, how much time do Richard and I have before we die? When Colin turned and looked back at her, Nikki was staring at her. Her blue eyes seemed filled with grim awareness of the death sentence she would pronounce. The call of death in both of you is growing exponentially. I can't give you an exact number, but the simple truth is that for both of you, it's at most only a matter of a handful of days. Colin swallowed. Days. It sounded too final. That's all? It's difficult to gauge your remaining time exactly. I must confess to you that when I was working to bring Richard back to consciousness, I could tell that you've both passed a critical point, and while you still may have days, death could now come at any moment. But there is a limit, Colin guessed, even if we manage to avoid it for a time. Even if we're lucky, even if we fight it, there is still a limit. Nikki nodded. I was a sister of the dark. And I dealt in such wicked things as have touched you both, so I know more about this than even Zed. He had an understanding of the seriousness of it, but feared to ask me anything more specific because he knew that I recognized such forces and their full meaning in a way that he could not. Because of my unique knowledge and experience, I can tell you that the way this poisonous call of death works, the way it kills, is unlike anything else. What do you mean? What is it doing that is different? It's severing your souls. Colin hadn't thought it could be any worse. She was wrong. You mean like the half-people? You mean we will become like them? Soulless bodies living on in a kind of meaningless, dead existence? Nikki shook her head. No, you're thinking of it in the wrong way. This is entirely different. In you and Richard, the call of death is slowly severing your link to your souls, much as if you were hanging by a thread over a deep abyss. What Jit unleashed is progressively severing the lifeline to your souls. It is the line of the gift that you were born with that in the grace flows from creation, through life, and then continues on with you into the world of the dead. Jit's poisonous call crossed the boundary between worlds. It is severing that line, connecting your souls to who you are. So you mean, Colin asked, repressing her panic, that when our souls are severed, that's it? That's the end of us? We die? Nikki searched for words. It's kind of difficult to explain, but it's more than being the end of you, more all-encompassing than merely dying. If we don't put a stop to it, pull it out of you, then you both will die, which is bad enough, but also your souls will be severed from everything, meaning not simply from the world of life, but from their connection to the gift that flows through our souls into the world beyond the veil. Once severed, your souls can never find their way to the good spirits beyond. So, in a way, by severing your souls in this way, this poison is not only killing your bodies, it is extinguishing your soul's existence. At this point, how long you last, I think, is only a matter of your will to hold on to life, how hard your spirits, your souls fight. 
Even so, you won't be able to hold on for more than a few days longer, and then the struggle will end. Your souls will be severed from you. Your bodies will die, and your souls themselves will wink out of existence like a dying ember. Colin realized that she had been holding her breath. She could feel tears welling up in her eyes. Will we even be remembered? She thought it was a rather meaningless question as soon as she asked it, but it seemed important to her. Nikki slowly shook her head. Once your souls are severed, existence itself is dissolved. It will be as if you never existed. Somehow that made it even worse. She looked up at Nikki, resisting the pronouncement. But that didn't happen to Jit. Her existence wasn't dissolved away by the sound of that scream, that call of death. We remember her. Jit was a different kind of creature. The poison she carried inside was intrinsic to her kind. That sound was never meant to be heard by humans. She had no soul to sever. Nikki wiped a tear from Colin's cheek. You do. Colin could hear the whispers and the screams in the back of her mind, the sound of death hungering to have her. She could feel those whispers getting closer. She knew from Richard's experience the night before that if either of them went unconscious again, they most likely would never wake. In the end, she didn't know which fate was worse, eventually falling into the clutches of what Sulachan had waiting for them in the underworld, or the haunting dread of soulless oblivion. Then I guess we had best get an early start so we can get to Savedra as soon as possible, Colin said. Nikki nodded. I agree. But try not to lose sight of the fact that I'm not going to let that happen to either of you. She took Colin's arm and started back. I will get it out of you. Chapter 52 The next day took them over a high pass with towering peaks soaring high all around, and then, from among the tall pines, lower through the mountains, down into more heavily wooded terrain. The lower forest was wetter, with frequent brooks draining the higher ground. They sometimes had to make their way through muddy areas to get around standing water. Some of the men scouted the way out ahead of the main group to make sure of the quickest route, while yet others protected them from a rear attack. Any Shuntuk who might still be alive were a constant worry. After what she had seen, Colin was sure they were all dead, but there was no way to be absolutely positive. Worse, though, there was always the possibility that Sulachan could have sent others, or that other tribes of half-people who had escaped through the gates of the Third Kingdom could be hunting the forests. After all, they weren't all that far from that dreaded, broken barrier. Ned had left at first light, taking their only horse and Richard's orders on the hard ride back to the People's Palace. It was somewhat disconcerting being without a horse because it was their fastest means of travel, but having only one did them little good. It was more important to get word to the palace and all the people there, letting them know what was coming so they could prepare. Colin shuddered to think of Hannes Ark, Emperor Sulachan, and all the Shuntuk having free run of the palace and all the artifacts kept there. In a way, that palace was the heart of hope for civilization. To have it fall to such evil made her blood run cold. They had to hold it until Richard was healed and could get back there. While a horse wouldn't get them to Savedra any faster, should Richard or Colin begin to lose strength, the horse could carry them easier than any other method. As much as Colin worried about not having the horse with them any longer, the farther they went it was becoming apparent that the mountains they were crossing were too rugged in places for a horse. They could have gone around in certain areas so a horse could make it, but that would have meant more travel time, and they didn't have the time to spare. Every moment of delay meant that she and Richard were a moment closer to dying. Colin's thoughts kept drifting back to the dark one Sulachan had waiting for them on the other side of that veil. There would be no peaceful eternity for the two of them. The Spirit King had seen to that. As they made their way down the mountain, the terrain was so difficult in places that the men had to fell small trees and stake them along the steep walls of crumbling rock to give them some kind of sure footing that wouldn't give way. It was a quick, flimsy, very temporary way to make it across otherwise impassable areas, but it was enough for them to keep moving forward without losing their footing or much time. Some of the places they had to traverse were quite steep, 
slippery and had loose rock that slid and tumbled down when disturbed. In those places, a rope tied to trees gave them a useful handhold. There was no easy way through the uncharted wilderness. They knew the direction of Saavedra, and if they wanted to get there, the quickest way was a direct route across the mountains. Fortunately, there were passes. Going around would add many days of travel, and they had no extra days to waste. After they had made their way down narrow, rocky trails, the terrain leveled out somewhat. Irina and Samantha used the opportunity to move in close to each side of Richard to protect him as they went through more open birch groves. Nikki stayed behind them where she could keep an eye on Irina. Irina, for her part, always managed to be right there near Richard, sometimes even stepping in front of Colin and Nikki to do so. Colin wasn't in the mood to start an argument with a woman. The wise thing to do was to ignore it and get to Saavedra. Besides, for all she knew, they might need Irina's extra abilities to cure them. When the trail narrowed again as they had to go down a narrow pass between steep, gray, rocky slopes to each side, and she had the chance, Colin took up Richard's hand and made it clear to the others, in a gentle manner, that she wanted to be with her husband. Irina, surprisingly enough, got the message. Colin wondered if perhaps the woman wasn't as inconsiderate as she had believed. At first, Samantha didn't get the idea, instead staying close to Richard as the way through began to widen so she could pepper him with trivial questions about how the trees could ever come to cling to such stony slopes overhead and how it compared to places he had been to and things he had seen before. She seemed to have an endless supply of questions and looked genuinely interested in every word of his answers. Richard seemed distracted and wasn't in a chatty mood, but he was nice enough as he answered her questions, if briefly. As they walked along an animal trail through knee-high grass, Zed finally slipped in close and put an arm around the young woman's shoulders. He told her that he wanted to show her some of the herbs that a young sorceress needed to know about. He steered her off through tall grasses and shrubs to point out plants with red berries growing up the soil bank below the steeper rock above. He launched into a lecture about the many uses of the berries, the leaves, and the roots of the plants he was showing her. Everything all right? Colin asked Richard once they were relatively alone. He gave her a puzzled look. No, not really. Why, what's wrong? Well, he said, as if trying to think of something. There was a man who has been dead for 3,000 years, and when Hannes Ark poured my blood over his mummified corpse, he came back to life. And now he wants to rule the world of life, with Lord Ark as the ruler of the Daharan Empire, I suppose. Oh, and you and I are near death from a poison we both carry, but we may all be eaten alive by half-people before we ever die from the poison. Sorry, she said. I didn't mean to get you upset. He waved a hand. No, it's not that. Then what is it? He let out a deep sigh. It's just everything. Everything? Anything in particular getting you down? I mean, more than the things you mentioned? For a time, he looked off to the sparse woods off through the grass to the side before answering. I'd just like to be alone with you. That's all. Ah, she said with a knowing smile. That. It was rather difficult being intimate in the middle of a camp of soldiers. That's not what I mean. Well, that too. But that's not what I mean. Then what do you mean? I mean like when I built that cabin for us way back to the west. In Westland? I've just been thinking about the time when we were alone and far from all the troubles of the world. Colin briefly pressed her head against the side of his shoulder. It will happen, Richard. Things will get better. We'll get rid of this awful poison, and then you will do whatever it is that you need to do to stop the unruly twins. And then we will be able to live in peace. He smiled at her description of Emperor Sulichan and Hannes Ark as if they were little more than mischievous boys. But I don't want to live in a tiny cabin, she said. I mean, I would if we had to, but I would rather we live at the People's Palace. Ah, he said with a smile, so I've married a girl with her eye on the finer things in life. Colin circled an arm around his waist. Finer than traipsing through a damp and gloomy wilderness with a bunch of soldiers? You bet. For one thing, I want a real bed in a room with a door, with a lock on the door. Richard couldn't help smiling. I would like that very much.
I bet you would, she teased with a gentle shove of her hip. He smiled again. She was happy that she'd been able to lighten his mood. She didn't know what was bothering him, but she was at least happy that she had been able to make him smile. 